Okay, I have a quorum of council in the chamber and a presentation ready to go. So uh, we are good to start this meeting. I'll call the meeting of Standing Committee on Planning, Transportation and Environment to order. Madam Clerk, can we have the roll call, please? Uh, Councillor Affleck and Councillor Carr, Here. you have a quorum, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. Okay, we only have one item of business on the agenda today, um, and there are speakers for it, so uh, we have nothing we need to do with the agenda. A few housekeeping announcements. Uh, if there are speakers who are not here, who are monitoring from afar, they can monitor the progress of this meeting via the video link on the city's website. And there's also updates at, on Twitter at Van City Clerk. Uh, what else do I have to say? I don't think I have anything else to say other than how pleased I am to welcome Dr. Penny Baum, city manager with the uh, four years in the making Healthy City Strategy. Welcome, Dr. Baum. Um, I'm just going to start this off uh, and then hand it over to Mary Claire Zach, um, and as, as you can see, Council, we have a lot of staff here today uh, and friends and colleagues and leaders in terms of the Healthy City Strategy who are here and speakers. So we're very excited to be bringing this back in its final form as our Phase 1 Healthy City Strategy for the City of Vancouver. Um, and I'll just give you a sort of, just a, a, a quick introduction on what this is about. Can we get it up on the... So you have it on your monitors, Council. Um, you see right up front here the recommendations that we're, we're going to be asking you to make, which is basically the document that you have attached to your Council report is constitutes the vision, principles, the long-term goals, targets, very specific targets, and indicators by which we're going to track these targets in our Healthy City for All strategy for the City of Vancouver. Um, and we will come back to you, as you can see in the recommendations and the report, with our detailed action plan. Um, there, the, there's, a, there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, as you'll see as we walk through the presentation today, there are a huge number of people that have been involved in this. As you'll also see, the City cannot deliver on this plan without the uh, real involvement of our public, uh, many of our partners, and you know the leadership who have sat around our leadership table with us and talked about this vision and why it's important and what are the key elements of it. All of those groups are going to be required for us to put together and implement an action plan that will deliver on these very ambitious but really, really important goals. Now, some people, as you know, in Canada, we've, um, in, in most municipalities, health has been devolved totally to health regions or other organizing structures um, under provincial governments. And in, in most parts of the province, with the exception of Ontario, public health officials have also been integrated into health authorities and health regions. Um, in the old days, as you know, we, we had a public health officer in the city of Vancouver, and many of you remember John Blatherwick, who is one of my mentors, um, you know, one of the most high-profile, ambitious, and lively public health officers uh, we ever had for many years. And then since uh, the time of regionalization in the mid-90s, um, the public health function has moved to our Vancouver Coastal Health Authority, which was formerly the VRHB, and we work very, very closely. Um, I think Dr. Patty Daly, I hope, is here today with us. I can't find you, Patty. Where are you? There she is. Um, we are very blessed and extremely fortunate to have such a great group of colleagues led by Dr. Daly in the Vancouver Coastal Health Region who are our very key partners in this Healthy City Strategy. And we've been working with them for, um, you know, a number of years on you know, bringing this to fruition uh, under the, the theme of a healthy city for all. 
you know, why do we need a healthy city strategy? Well, it's, it's good for everybody. It's good for our residents. It's good for our economy. Um, it's fundamental to the sustainability of, you know, a city that is a great place to live and, you know, has a bright future for all of its residents and the people who visit and, and work there. And so, you know, our goal really is that we become a global leader in, in planning for health and the well-being of our citizens. Um, this, this whole strategy is designed to focus our priorities. Um, there are many, many things that we can focus on, but what you'll see here in the 13 goals are what we think are the fundamental priorities that actually will, will allow us to become a truly healthy city for all and a global leader. The document is also designed in the strategy to be very clear about whose role it is to actually lead or be a part of um, these different um, goals. And what you'll see is a familiar graphic that we've used in the city because it really helps both our staff and our partners understand that the city knows we can't deliver all these things. We, we, we may not have the jurisdiction, the statutory responsibility, we may not have the fiscal capacity and often these areas are complex and there are many levels of government and other partners in the community that actually have a role so that it, it is a it's a group effort to actually deliver on the goals um, we want this strategy to provide a foundation that actually drives us to this kind of integrated work and thinking um, and it then by definition really pushes us to continue to create innovative relationships partnerships to actually get our work done to the benefit of our public. And by identifying very clear quantitative targets, um, this is not an easy thing to do. And having been through this exercise many, many times over my decades in public service, um, governments tend to, and staff in our bureaucracies, tend to you know, be safe and say, OK, well, let's set a target that we know we can get there. And that's not necessarily the best way to go, that's not necessarily going to get you to the goals of a healthy city for all. So I would say the targets that you'll see in this are very ambitious. Um, they're, they're very real. They are attainable, but, but they're not going to be easy to attain. And it's going to require all of us to be strategic, creative, innovative, and find leverage um, you know, with partners, other levels of government to actually arrive at the goals. Vancouver, as you know, Council, um, we're very, very blessed and fortunate. Uh, we, we were blessed with a natural setting that has allowed us um, many years ago to start developing our global brand. We, we have a climate that in contrast to the rest of our country, we're sort of the California of Canada. We have a temperate climate. Um, we, we have a lot of the advantages of being able to be out and be active all year round and not have to worry about you know really, really cold weather or a lot of snow. Um, and that, that's, you know, we don't have to clear snow as often as where I grew up in Montreal. So there's lots of advantages to a temperate climate. We, we have an incredible innovation economy and it's a creative economy, it's an entrepreneurial economy and it's growing fast, it's, it's globally leading and the statistics, you know, even for next year are, are that the conference board reports that Vancouver will lead the cities across the country in terms of GDP growth um, next year. We have an incredibly diverse population of which we're very, very proud. And as a city, we are continuing to work to find new ways to embrace the diversity, to make everyone feel safe and included, and to actually include all the different you know, diversity in actually achieving some of these very fundamental goals. Because the discussion with different parts of our community by definition, has to be different. Everybody comes at health and well-being from a different lens, and we need to recognize that. And I think you'll see in the, in the public engagement that we did that there was some really re remarkably innovative ways of approaching and making sure we did engage, you know, both across the age demographics and across the diversity of our community, many, many people in this discussion. And we are blessed that, you know, our... Our Vancouver Coastal Health Authority has some of the best population health statistics in the whole country and indeed in the world. So we have generally a healthy population. But I think what we know for, for those of us who spend a lot of time looking at this kind of data, 
that notwithstanding the overall average may be really great. Um, there, are, there are health inequities. There are, there are subgroups in our population who aren't doing nearly as well, and we have to focus on how we bring their well-being and their overall health um, up to the standard of, of the whole population. And so these are some of our challenges. Our, as all parts of Canada, um, our population is aging, and the number of seniors is going to double by 2036 in Vancouver. And seniors bring a lot of benefit to our communities. And they, on, on the health side, we're living longer, we're living healthier lives, but there continue to be demands. And we've had lots of different discussions you know, over the last term of this council um, around some of the, the things that we're trying to do around seniors. And council has been very, um, very clear and directive to staff that you know, they want us to have in place uh, a strategy for dementia and they want us to be looking at our, our bylaws, our building bylaw, to make sure that it's suitable for a population that is going to age and uh, on and on. We also have issues around income, and 21% of the households in Vancouver have what's considered low income under the Stats Canada definitions. And there are growing income disparities, and that's an issue for this country. Um, it's something that has got worse across, worse across Canada in the last 15 years. It's something that there, there is concern about, and you know, we as a city can't control all of that, but we have to think about it. We have to become more knowledgeable about what can our role be um, to try and address that problem. And I think in British Columbia as a whole, uh, we know the, the stat status of child poverty. Uh, it is a, a big problem in our province, and it has been tracked um, at the provincial level, and it's something that I think all of you have talked about at different times and know that we, we do need a provincial action plan around child poverty and we know in Vancouver that 35% of our children entering kindergarten have some degree of vulnerability. And one of the you know, global researchers in this area, Clyde Hertzman, um, who unfortunately died in the last couple of years, much to many of our dismay, um, was a global leader in understanding vulnerability of children. And so this is another thing that many of the things that you've pushed us on, childcare, um, partnerships with our school board, creating capacity for preschool programs are all part of addressing this issue and there's more to be done. I've talked about health inequities and our need to address that. And I think that one of the most important questions for us, because this came up a number of times in our discussion around our leadership table, is, well, why is the city leading the strategy um, on, on sort of a healthy city strategy? Because health is the jurisdiction of our health authority. And I think one of the things that we've learned, um, no matter what area, council, you direct us to address, is that the city, you know, the, the city to a certain extent is like a big public health agency. In lots of ways, we have control over some of the most important determinants of health. And essentially, we are also an enabler. And we can bring people together. We have the status of government, but we also have a connection with our public that no other level of government can have. We're closer to the ground. We see and serve our public every day. We have 10,000 staff who interact with our public, whether it's through our libraries, our community centers, collecting their, their solid waste addressing um, infrastructure, you know, in our residential and commercial areas. Our, our, our citizens come into contact with city staff every single day. And we are regarded as a place where you can have a safe discussion about these things. So both as an enabler and as a level of government that actually has the ability to actually impact through a robust system of libraries, through our contribution to childcare, um, through our advocacy around um, you know, poverty, we, we can have a lot more impact than sometimes we believe is possible when you just look at our fiscal capacity. And this, this graphic really illustrates that concept that the city has a number of tools for impacting change. And on the far left of this, you can see policy and regulation, which is a fundamental role for us, all the way to providing programs and services on the far right. And you know, the development of partnerships, the, the, the funding of research to look into problems to better, better understand them, um, creating public infrastructure that's critical to enabling things. We know in childcare, as an example, that the city of Vancouver 
probably leverages more public infrastructure for childcare than, than on a per capita basis than anywhere else in the country. And that's really, really important because once you get the infrastructure built, then it's easier, you know, to try and leverage the operating funds to actually make it happen. And so these are all the different ways that we work um, to actually leverage the kind of goals that we're going to be working toward. And really importantly, if you look at all the literature around, you know, sustainability, the broad interpretation of sustainability as a city, there are three major fundamental elements to that, and that's a vibrant and successful economy, um, uh, an environment that is sustainable and, and healthy to live in, and finally, a social sustainability framework, um, which is where we've, where we've embedded our healthy city strategy. And so with this plan, um, Council, pending your approval and direction today, the healthy city strategy will complete the environmental, social, and economic legs to the stool for a sustainable city that we've been working on over a number of years. This graphic, um, for somebody my age, um, I actually can't see it from here, but it's, it's really a one-page thing that is, the, is the really connecting the dots from you know, the very center of our goal, which is a healthy city for all our residents and a healthy city for all the people who come here to work in our city, because we know that thousands of people every day come from different parts of the region to actually work in our city and, and in fact, sometimes spend more time in Vancouver than they do in their home community. And this strategy builds out from that goal and connects in the outer ring to all the different plans, um, you know, essentially our transportation plan as an example, our housing and homeless strategy, our cultural plan, um, all the different works our community plans that you have approved and, and provided your guidance and oversight and very clear direction to us. And so our work is all interconnected. And one of the, I think one of the most remarkable things that, you know, I feel very proud of in our organization is that I think right down to, you know, the, the people that are out delivering our streets works or replacing our public infrastructure, everyone who works in our organization really understands their role and they would be able to find their, their, their role in participating in achieving our healthy city goals when, when they look at this one graphic that connects it all together. And that's what you want because otherwise you duplicate effort, you get silos that don't talk to each other. And so a lot of the work that we're going to achieve in reaching these goals is actually already underway through one of our plans or another. And in some cases we're going to ramp it up and nuance it, bring in other partners but this is as streamlined as, as you could get in terms of a coherent approach to getting to the goals of the healthy city. And I'm going to just um, end on this slide. In the work that we've done um, in terms of taking all the building blocks that you'll see reflected as Mary Claire walks you through the rest of this presentation um, and bringing that into a coherent plan with a, a set number of goals that we believe are achievable and ambitious. There was a leadership table established by the project. Um, there was 30 people on that table and as you can see they, they came from all levels of government, the federal government, um, the provincial government, in some cases several representatives from different sectors in those levels of governments sat at the table. We had people from the philanthrop philanthropy community, obviously public health, those who are responsible for delivering health services, social justice, arts and culture, business, education, um, those involved in settlement of our immigrant and refugee communities. So a broad, you know, really outside the box, uh, box I, I would say a really what I would see as a determinants of health um, representation at this leadership table that actually provided us um, a lot of leadership, a lot of advice, oversight of, of our project, and every meeting that we had, which I had the privilege of chairing, we probably had, I would say, upwards of 20 to 30 city staff that attended from all across the organization and listened um, respectfully to the discussion, provided input and facts when they were asked, but actually I think whether it was from VPD or our fire service, planning, engineering, various parts of engineering, arts and culture, like you would see our library representatives from all of the 
city family at these meetings to try and make sure that we, A, we appropriately supported, and B, we understood the thinking of our, our leaders out in the community who are going to be our key partners in terms of implementing with us the work towards reaching these goals. And so um, it, it was really a remarkable process in that way. And Mary Claire's team, you know, who actually organized this, kept the paper trail, recorded the discussions, you know, basically synthesized, um, took all of that, and, and ultimately, as you know, the document that you have is a very elegant document. It, it looks really easy to write something like that. I can tell you when you look at the paper that's behind it and the research and the evidence base, it's really, really tough to create a, a coherent document that the public can read and understand that all of you feel really you can get your head around where we're going and why and all of our partners can feel like they can um, into it. So I really want to just take this opportunity to thank um, all of our, our partners and particularly our city staff and Mary Claire, particularly your group. I'm going to hand it over to you now to um, walk council through the rest of this. Good morning, everybody, and it's great to be here. I'll just carry along in the right direction. All right. What I wanted to mention with this slide is just to talk about some of the key components of the strategy. And it does build on some previous strategies uh, that traces all the way back, in fact, to the four pillar strategy, uh, to our work on urban health, uh, to other work that many, many departments have been involved in. And that's why we have a technical team that represents all departments across the city and helping us work this through. Many of the strategies involve um, many, many different departments. It really is a team effort. Did a literature review on international best practice across the world and locally, and consultation, of course, with our department partners and, and across the city. We've held, had a very strong partnership through a memorandum of understanding and other events with Vancouver Coastal Health. We had a Healthy City Summit in June 2012, and most recently, a Healthy City Summit in June 2014, where Dr. Karen Lee joined us from New York City to talk to ourselves, uh, staff from Vancouver Coastal Health, and other community partners about what we can do collaboratively on creating a healthy built environment for our residents. The Healthy City Leadership Table and through the efforts of the tech team really supported our public engagement events, which I'll speak through in a little bit. And here we are with our first phase of our Healthy City Strategy. So that just gives you a sense of where we're at. The partnerships, the things that are really critical to us are our partnerships and, and our innovation and what's going to be critical to us to going, go, go, going forward is going to be our upstream thinking and the action that we take going forward. To be a healthy city for all, we have to look at these access, an access towards wellness and an access away from crisis. So that's going to be very, very critical for us as we move along. I'm not moving anywhere. Speaking of moving along, got to go upstream. <laughs> yeah, I could get a hand there. Thanks, Carolyn. Never my strong point in terms of uh, the technology. There we go. <laughs> okay. So just on to the objectives, I can talk a little bit about um, our, um, what we did in terms of our objectives around our engagement process that we held. And there were three objectives we had around that. And one was to build understanding of the Healthy City Strategy. The second was to gather innovative ideas uh, from all of our residents across the city. And thirdly, to invite residents to, to take action on what those ideas might be. And we really wanted them to take action and think of things that would help us reach our goals and our targets. We had a, a variety of formats. Um, our engagement team and staff at the city were very helpful to us. Uh, there were in-person opportunities through ideas labs and open houses and information tables. Uh, we had a number of online opportunities uh, for people to submit ideas through the city website, through Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. And there were other activities that happened at the same time, including an innovation conference, um, another forum um, on the future of urbanity, environment, and our lifestyle. And I already mentioned the uh, summit that we held with uh, Vancouver Coastal Health. There are some key themes that we heard through that. 
Uh, you know, as you can see, what's very, very important to Vancouverites is a sense of community, a sense of neighborhood, a sense of place. And those are the strong themes that really, really came out during our consultation. So that just gives you a visual of some of the key themes and the key ideas that, that we heard about. Penny talked about uh, roles, mandates, and the city's role in this. We know that we have together a collective responsibility to achieve our goals. And what this shows is that through all of the uh, 12 goal areas that we've identified, there are some areas where the city uh, can lead, where the city has leverage, and there's other areas where we're really going to be depending upon our, par our partners through the not-for-profit sector, community organizations, and other groups to help us get there. And that's why we built and created the 13th goal on leadership, which I'll explain as I walk you through the goal areas. Social innovation is also going to be critical to us. We need to be doing and thinking things about things differently in order to achieve these goals and targets. We know that they're ambitious. As the BC Partners for Social Impact have said, a true social innovation is systems changing. It alters our perceptions, behaviors, relationships, and the structures that previously gave rise to the challenges that we face in the first place. So I'm just going to walk you through some of the goals um, that we've identified and some of those targets and talk to you a little bit about how we're going to be um, proceeding with measuring those going forward. So our first goal is a good start, ensuring that uh, Vancouver's children have the best chance of enjoying a, a healthy childhood. And by 2025, we want to see that at least 85% of Vancouver's children are ready, uh, developmentally ready when they enter kindergarten. And we know that on the EDI, which is, um, was, Clyde Hertzman was instrumental, as Dr. Bellin was saying, in, in the EDI, the children's vulnerability on Van in Vancouver is about 35%, and it varies across the city. So what we aim to do um, over the next 10 years is reduce that so that 85% of children are ready um, for school. And we're going to be looking at, in terms of measuring that school readiness through the EDI, child poverty, as well as access to licensed, affordable, and accessible childcare. And we certainly heard about the need for place-based supports for parents, childcare, uh, through our consultation process and engagement. A Home for Everyone is our second one. Of course, we know that availability, affordability, and the quality of housing, housing can have a serious impact on our, on our life and on our health and our well-being generally, and affect those conditions. These are targets that you're familiar with. They come right out of the housing and homelessness strategy. Uh, we'll be measuring these through the households spending mo more than 30% or more of their income on housing, uh, the number of sheltered and, and unsheltered homeless, new supportive social secured rental and secondary rental housing units. And I also want to note that there will be also an indicator that we'll be monitoring throughout around the number of Aboriginal uh, people that are homeless. There are actually four indicators that we're looking at across the Healthy City Strategy that measure the well-being of Aboriginal people specifically, given that we know that they are disproportionately affected in areas of health and well-being. Okay, and we heard plenty around uh, during our engagement process around the need for more affordable housing, different types of housing and alternative housing models. Feeding ourselves well, uh, we have the Vancouver su uh, food strategy and this goal area uh, comes from that, that we have a healthy, just and sustainable food system and the target also comes from the Vancouver food strategy which you're familiar with. Uh, we will be measuring this target going forward and looking at the number of food assets, continuing to track those. Our neighborhood food networks and the number of those, we know that in 2012 over 20,000 residents participated in our 11 food networks across the city. And we'll also be looking at the costs of Canada's National Nutritious Food Basket. We know that food is becoming more expensive for people and it's a key and consistent finding is that income assistance recipients don't receive an adequate income uh, for a food basket. And what we heard during our consultation was concerns around food affordability but for a lot of people too, the need for more community gardens, opportunities for food sharing and community kitchens and a way to convene and bring people together. A variety of different times in our lives, we will turn to services for support. And so for this goal area, we've identified that we want to see Vancouverites have equitable access to high quality social community and health services. We have two targets here. One is to increase the percentage of Vancouverites who report having access to services when they need them by 25% over current levels. 
and that all Vancouver residents are attached to a family doctor. So what you'll see in the graph there is in the Vancouver um, health area is that 72% of residents are attached to a family doctor and uh, we like to get um, better than that so that we have all residents being attached to a family doctor. We have a fantastic social service sector in the cities, some of whom are represented uh, here with us today, providing a number of services across the spectrum, children, youth, families, to women, immigrants, Aboriginal people, uh, through our community centres and in our neighbourhood houses, and we'll be working together with them also around achieving this target. Making ends meet and working well, there's a strong connection between income and health outcomes that's very, very well established. And um, so what we're going to be doing in our goal is really wanting to make sure that there's adequate income to cover the cost of basic necessities and that people have a broad range of access to employment opportunities. By 2025, we have an ambitious target to reduce the city's poverty rate by 75% and by the same time increase the median income by at least 3% every year. During our consultation process and engagement, people talked about the need for a living wage to be adopted, uh, social procurement policies and practices, exchanging and sharing goods and services, and more, more low barrier employment, training opportunities, um, opportunities for low income artists, etc. Feeling that we're safe and included, of course, is vital to being a healthy city. Um, so our, what we want to achieve is that we are a safe city in which residents feel secure, and we have three targets here in order to do that. One is to increase our sense of belonging by 2025 by 10%, to increase residents' sense of safety, and by 2025, make Vancouver the safest major city in Canada by reducing violent and property crime every year including sexual assault and domestic violence. The slide here shows that from the VPD, a reported violent crime rate is reducing, but we know that there are inequities, particularly with respect to gender, and uh, the call for a gender lens uh, being applied to this um, as we go through this work, just to ensure that um, uh, there's, there's safety there for all and for everybody. In terms of our engagement, we heard about the need for cross-cultural training, awareness, uh, the need for uh, competency, particularly with Aboriginal uh, people, Aboriginal inclusion, uh, putting a focus on, uh, as I mentioned, uh, women, uh, particularly Aboriginal and immigrant women, and strengthening relationships between um, Vancouver citizens and residents and police. Cultivating connections, of course, relationships are the heart of a good life. We are by nature, we're social creatures, and these critical social networks are really important for us, uh, for our well-being. Our attachment to one another runs very, very, very deep. So what we are going to propose here is that by 2025, all Vancouver rights report they have at least four people in their network that they can rely upon in times of need, as we all have those times. And also that we increase our voter turnout to 60% in the next 10 years. So our last voter turnout was about 35% and we're looking forward to, to that increasing. What we are going to be looking at in terms of how to measure that are social support networks, uh, sense of trust, rates of volunteerism, municipal voter turnout is another one, and also Aboriginal children in foster care. What we've learned through our research uh, the environic study that was presented to Council a couple of years ago, just as we were beginning our work uh, around Year of Reconciliation, is we know that um, the studies that have been done on Aboriginal children in foster care, we know that they make up about 50% of the children in foster care, that when they are connected to their culture and connected to their community, they fare much better. Our eighth goal is around active living and getting outside. We know that being outdoors and getting outside and being active is good for our bodies, it's good for our minds. And even better if we can get out and enjoy the outdoors while we're doing that. So we want to see that Vancouverites are engaged in active living and have uncomparable access to nature. So by 2020, we'd like to see, this is from the Greenest City Action Plan, uh, all residents live within a five minute walk of a park, garden, greenway, or the green space. And by 2025, we would like to increase the percentage of Vancouver residents aged 18 and older who meet 
the uh, physical act guidelines by 25% over the current 2014 levels. So most Vancouverites, we do have access to green space, but we know that there are some disparities and we're generally active, but what we're learning is that we may not be active enough. Uh, so there needs to be some more work done to around access, uh, both to green space and access also for recreation uh, for people who can't afford it in particular. In terms of lifelong learning, our goal here is to have equitable access to lifelong learning and development opportunities. We know learning is important throughout our lives, whether it's early childhood or adulthood. And we know that people who are engaged in lifelong learning are better prepared to participate in civic life and it also helps with our economic development. So it's a very, very important goal for us. The library has been very, very engaged in a learning city and in creating a learning city for the city of Vancouver. And with their team, we worked uh, together to create this goal area and also identified uh, the target, which is to increase participation in lifelong learning by 25% over 2014 levels. What we heard during our consultation was a uh, need for uh, training, mentorship, um, opportunities to bridge cultures and, and many, many uh, needs for learning opportunities that could be both formal as well as informal. And, um, and that's what we're looking at when we talk about lifelong learning. Just want to point out we're looking at formal learning as well as informal opportunities and where those are. Goal number 10 is around expressing ourselves. And we know that when we express ourselves in arts and culture, we are healthier. Yeah, we know that it's better for all of us. We have a rich and diverse cultural sector, many, many artists. We also have many cultural spaces. Um, and what we're going to be measuring as we go through this target, we want to increase uh, public participation in community engagement as well as in arts and culture by 25% over 2014. We want to measure the number of participants, the number of workers in the arts and culture sector, and the creative places and spaces. During our consultation, we heard about the need for more events and festivals. Uh, Vancouverites love those, the access to venues, the access to performance space, and of course, public art. In terms of getting around, um, the goal here is that all of us enjoy safe, active, and accessible ways of getting across the city. And the target is taken from the Greenest City Action Plan and Transportation 2040, so Council will be familiar with that. Um, currently, we know that 44% of our trips are made by walking, transit, or, or, or cycling. And we are, over time, choosing more sustainable modes of, of transportation. And I think this speaks to you know, how this promotes health, its physical, mental, also our social connections that we gain through, through walking and other modes of transit. Environments to thrive in is our 12th goal. And here we would like to see that Vancouver rights have the right to a healthy environment and equitable access to livable environments in which they can thrive. What we want to see happen here is that we add to the Greenest City Action Plan a biodiversity target and a target related to toxins prevention. Uh, we know that staff are currently working on a biodiversity strategy and a target that speaks to the walk score of every uh, neighborhood in Vancouver so that most errands can be done on foot. Um, as you can see from the graph, there's a vari some variation. In some neighborhoods, we have a walk score of 90 to 100 in our downtown area, 70 to 89 in other art parts of the city. But towards the south and the northeast, it's below that, um, that uh, it, there's, there's some areas that we could move up to that 70% 70, 70 score. And what we heard during our uh, consultation was people want more public space, they want more social interaction. Um, those are some examples that we heard. Our 13th goal area was the last one that we added just recently, and it came from the leadership table. The goal being that the leaders from private, public, and civil sectors in Vancouver, that we work together in an integrated way collaboratively towards achieving a vision for a healthy city for all of our residents. What we'd like to see as our target is that 90% of the actions that are developed in phase two be implemented. And I think that the quote from Steve Butts uh, pretty much says it all. Um, he talks about the promise of a vision exhibited by this plan must be matched by building a network where the contribution of many is valued and adds up to something significant. 
and the days are over when any of us can tackle the big issues and opportunities alone, we all have something to give and something to get. So in terms of measuring this, we'll be looking at our part, the level of participation and, of course, the, the actions being implemented and doing some evaluation of that. I reflected yesterday in the words of Robert Joseph. He talked, uh, Dr. Robert Joseph talked uh, during the, the council session yesterday on reconciliation about Vancouverites and their willingness for change and the time for change. And I just wanted to add this quote that he provided to us being a key facilitator at one of our sessions that we had, an ideas lab that really focused on Aboriginal communities in, in the city. He said, let us find a way to belong to this time and place together. Our future and the well-being of all of our children rests with us and the kind of relationships that we build today. And it also really speaks to our council's whole notion around sustainability is that the decisions we do make today uh, will impact uh, future generations. So a big thank you to all of our Healthy City Leadership Table. Uh, the three of the names and their organizations are, are listed here. And also to so, so many participant, participants. I want to thank also my staff, who are many of them here with me, Dr. Ali Grant, Caroline Young, Lindsay Neufeld, Peter Marriott. Um, there have been many, many of the staff in my group who have uh, participated, Nicola Sharp. The technical team that's behind me representing every department in the city who has been very, very involved. But also there have been a number of, of organizations that we wouldn't be here today without. Vancouver Coastal Health, a number of staff, who are some of whom are here today uh, with our partnership with them. A number of organizations, our community centers, our neighborhood houses, and they're all listed in, in our appendix. So in terms of our next steps, we'll be reporting back to Council, uh, pending <coughs> Council's decision today, and with an action plan on how we're going to be implementing this all together with our key partners and reaching those targets and working very closely with the leadership table and others in the development of the plan. And we know that those partnerships are, are going to be vital for us to be delivering on the goals. So that concludes our presentation and staff will be ready for questions. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Sack and um, Madam City Manager. Um, there are a lot of staff here available to answer questions, as Council will see on your agenda. Um, I think what we'll do out of um, respect for the speakers is do just one round of questions, and then we'll move to speakers, and then we'll go back to questions at the end. Okay, uh, so first up, we have Mayor Robertson on the queue. You have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, well, first and foremost, a huge thank you to everyone who's brought this forward, made this possible, and years of work that's gone into it. All the people in this room who've contributed countless hours to putting this together, and what I, I see as a groundbreaking piece of work, not only for Vancouver, but for cities all over the world. I, I expect this will be, um, will be uh, studied carefully by many other cities, and uh, that a lot of the, the great ideas that have been gleaned from other cities and, and brought together in this plan, I think, will, uh, will be reflected back as we advance uh, on our, toward our goals. So I'm really, really thankful to the people, and particularly those who went, uh, went to great lengths to be involved. The, um, the leadership table, the 30 people who, who are leaders and experts in the fields, uh, to the technical team, all of the folks uh, on staff and all the different departments who uh, participated and, and all of the um, folks in the community from different organizations and key partners. Um, and great to have seen so many people engaged both live, over 1,000 people live and 10,000 online as well. So uh, great to have an exhaustive effort to reach out and make sure we build a robust plan to make the city healthier and to really connect the dots. What I love is, is how this uh, brings together all of the the big plans that we have built in recent years and integrates them and, and puts, runs everything through that filter of being a healthier city, uh, which, is, which is really, I think, the ultimate uh, purpose that we serve uh, here uh, as, as elected leaders and staff working for the people of the city uh, going forward. So a big, huge thanks for that. And um, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing from speakers on this. Uh, the, the quick questions I'll start off with. Uh, first, on, uh, on the advocacy side and the importance of 
the partnerships with the provincial and federal government here. We've uh, a, a lot of the work that we do obviously relies on partnerships with the other levels of government, and uh, health uh, is no no different. And you've you've talked about overlaps and uh, and the gaps that we have on a number of areas. Um, the advocacy piece has, has been a challenge for us, uh, whether it's related to housing or it's related to economic development or different pieces that we have a, a piece, a portion of, but um, re requires advocacy. And I'd love to hear your sense for uh, for next steps in terms of what comes back in the action plan. It, I My assumption is it's very focused on what we can do in the city. Uh, and we look forward to seeing that. I know a lot of work has already been done to put that together in, in, in the years of, uh, of work. The advocacy piece, particularly with uh, the federal and provincial governments, could you just speak to um, whether uh, staff and, and our amazing array of experts and leaders on this will be bringing back some guidance and uh, advice on that front, or if you're anticipating that that's work that council will need to sort out and. Uh, that's more uh, more directly political, I guess, to put it bluntly, uh, versus there there is clear advocacy steps that um, that we should be considering around the policy side and the partnerships. Maybe I'll start. <clears throat> it's a very important um, point, and I think we've we're learning a lot about advocacy. Having worked in the province for six years, there were two words as bureaucrats we were never allowed to use. One was advocacy, the other was taxes. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't allowed to ask for a new tax. And you couldn't, you couldn't say you were advocating for anything. So, but I think, I think the point is that governments everywhere are under pressure. And what we have found to be most effective is, you know, to, to come forward to whatever level of government, whether it be the provincial or federal or regional, um, on a particular topic that's difficult and where people have struggled to solve it, uh, with, with basically you know, the first discussion being like, nobody has to go this alone. This is something that's going to involve a lot of people. Um, and here are the different ways that, you know, whether it's the city or our partners can actually help make a contribution so that you're not just landing the problem on any one government's lap and saying, well, over to you, uh, can we solve this? So I think that's been a really important learning. And Council, you, you sent us on a couple of journeys. I always remember methadone being one where we had absolutely no jurisdiction. But in fact, um, through the work of our group here, many of them the same, we actually got some changes that um, you know, were long awaited and much needed in, in how methadone was run as a program in, in the province. So it's understanding where we are, we can be an enabler at the city and advocacy and strategic advocacy is part of that. So um, I think the second thing is that you have to have your fact base, you need to have your evidence and it, it has to cut through the different perspectives that people bring to the table because we have our perspective and our data but other people also have you know their their perceptions and their experience and so having the most comprehensive um, story that's evidence-based to actually present for dialogue and discussion in a kind of an advocacy like um, undertaking is really really important and it's interesting when you talk about any of these issues that people do have different perspectives and they bring a different experience and and because of that they actually have different ideas about solutions so by working together and I think that's where the leadership table was so broad and the, some of the discussions were quite remarkable and you know for some of us who've been talking about these issues for a long time I think there was a lot of innovative and creative ideas some of them you'll hear from speakers today that actually there are other ways to to sort of help deliver on these uh, structural problems that we've been trying to address. So okay. those, are, those are my comments. I don't know, Mary Claire, if you want to add anything. Yeah. The only thing I would add is we know that what will set this um, plan apart from other strategies are, are two things. One is is that we have robust data um, from mm -hmm. which, which to measure our success and our results. The second is is that collaborative piece that we have all wheels of, the, of our sustainability stool in, in play here, that we have uh, the voice from the, our economic plan, from our Green City Action Plan, and from this plan working together and working in tandem, and that we're making decisions that are based on, on those three things. So I think those two things too are things to keep in mind that we've, we've tried to set in place here as we go forward. Okay, and maybe just to follow up on that <clears throat> piece around metrics and targets, there are uh, very clear targets, great to see uh, specificity around targets and metrics. And, and I know 
many of them, as I scan through it, we are tracking or the, the data is readily available. Do we have a much workload in terms of new uh, metrics that we're going to have to track? Uh, and, and how confident are you we'll be able to capture all of the, uh, the data, the information that's required to keep a, a, a current dashboard for council going forward on this? That's going to be part of our next steps going forward. We will need to create a, a system and uh, work with our partners to create that, that kind of a dashboard. And that's what we would like to be, do to be able to do some regular reporting. So some of the metrics that we have identified, you know, they're not available or they won't get renewed every two years, for example. But, right. but there's other ways for us to, you know, be able to monitor and track. So we're using a number of data. Um, not just relying on census data, a number of pieces of data um, that will help us move this along, but developing a system by which we can track in the most simple way, but the most effective way, is part of our next step going forward. Great. Thank you. Yeah. That's probably my time. Is it, it is your time. Thanks, Mayor Robertson. Uh, next up, we have Councillor Jang. Uh, with, as uh, Mayor Robertson, I want to thank staff for a very nice piece of work, you know, for my reading, and it's been going on for a long time. Uh, I just want to go back and look at some history. Last night I was kind of playing around online, figuring this out, and so it really goes back to the four pillar strategy, if I remember correctly. You know, uh, people said, well, what's next after the four pillars? And four pillars was, was very strong because we had an addiction problem, a heroin overdoses in our city. It was criticized for the sense that it was focused very much on addictions only, and only some of the pillars were influenced, uh, were actually supported, and others. So that whole notion of coming together and looking at things holistically and together was important. And then uh, I remember uh, working uh, with staff on, originally on the mental health plan for the city of Vancouver. That sort of came next, looking at what we can do to enhance mental health services. Uh, and from there, that kind of morphed. We took four pillars, mental health, uh, together into the urban health strategy. I remember that, and then it's kind of grown, and now we've actually taken it right out now to the healthy city strategy. Is that a correct assessment of the long lineage? I mean, it, you know, I, I know that uh, healthy city started about 2010, but it actually started long before that. Is it correct? That would be that would be absolutely correct. So, the, in a change in a focus from specifically focus on a very very particular vulnerable population and broadening it out to the whole city, is the approach that we took. I also want to say. So that in terms of social sustainability and a plan for social sustainability, this has been something that I know, not just myself, social planners from two decades back had been really wanting to see. So in a way, we, for the whole city, so in a way we were able to marry these two things together, the comprehension of the entire city while also making sure, and you've seen our principles, with an eye to um, all residents but also those who are, are experiencing vulnerability or marginalization in some way. I think that's a very important point, uh, is that you know, we've actually started to move policy from focusing on very specific things into more broader, comprehensive ideas and plans. You know, certainly I work in healthcare, Dr. Ballum does, I, you know, Dr. Daly, everybody work, we, we all focus on the disease, for example. And recently I was, uh, you know, uh, under the care of Vancouver Coastal Health, and after taking care of my immediate problem, uh, we had all the questions about, you know, how many do you have anybody you can rely on to help you out? You know, uh, you know, do you, well, how's your job doing? And all these other things, which were important. And it sort of said to me, you know, we should have actually turned this upside down, right? And prevented the problem I had in the first place just by looking after some of these these issues. I, and I think that's is that a correct assessment of what the plan is trying to do? It's actually trying to turn that upside down, start with generalities to prevent problems from occurring, in order to uh, help people out. Yeah, I believe, and Dr. Patty Daly can correct me, but I think what I heard her say once that about 25% of our actual health and well-being is reliant on the actual healthcare system. 75% takes place outside of that healthcare system. So all those other determinants of health, like our, our income, our our other you know connections with people, um, uh, food, housing, all of those things that are important to us in terms of our well-being, happen outside of that. So, mm -hmm. correct. so uh, well, that's, uh, that's great. It was very interesting as a patient for the first time to actually realize all that. You know, you're lying there, and I was always on the other side of the bed this time. <laughs> you know, oh, yeah, I do have to worry about that. Oh, yeah, what about food and nutrition? Can I walk to the grocery store uh, to get this to you know, kind of use my legs again and, th and things like that? Uh, would you say that the Healthy City Strategy, this phase, is probably, you know, in my research, I haven't found any other city that has had a plan like this, that this is really cutting edge. Would, would that be correct from your reading? 
You can toot your own horn if you want. Well, I think the one thing that is important is the robustness of the targets and the, and the indicators that we're going to use. As I say, I think that's what points makes this different and would make it stand out from other healthy city strategies around the world. Okay. Well, that's all my questions. Thank you very much. Jang, uh, next up we have Councillor Tang. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just first, up, I'd just like to say thank you very much for a very comprehensive plan. And then now I understand how all of these chains uh, connect to each other. Especially, I like this uh, circle uh, diagram. It reminds me about the old time the slide rule we use for the circle slide rule in the old engineering school. Anyway, just looking at this one, I know quite a lot about the age-friendly action plan because I was uh, one of the, um, the counselor I worked really hard with the staff and got this through. And then, but uh, so I'm not going to ask uh, too many questions on that one. But just look, uh, look across from the diagram, then for the uh, health environment, and then part of it is being and feeling safe and inclu included. Actually, that part of it is pretty much related to the age, uh, part of the age-friendly action plan too uh, for some of the actions. So I'm quite interested in uh, asking some question about that. One of them specifically is the uh, feeling safe. Um, because my reading here is 19% and 27% respectfully uh, in the last five years, the violent crime and the property crime decreased in those areas. So, so, uh, so actually, in reality, the, the crimes have reduced. But how you, what steps do you take to make people feel safe? And, and I, I'm kind of interested in. I, I'm going to. I'll start here. You know, obviously. Um, Direct prevention of crime is a, is a big part of the VPD's role, but I think our work with VPD has really shown us and, and them that whether it's libraries, early intervention with children, you know, healthy schools, all of these things actually make a difference. But I, I'm going to ask Daryl if he wants to say a few words. Toot your horn, Daryl. Thank you. Uh, yeah, because feeling is a very um, subjective. You're absolutely right. It's a very subjective measurement. Uh, for those that don't know me, Superintendent Darrell Wee, Vancouver Police. Um, the, uh, the figure that I believe is quoted in there is actually a Metro Vancouver um, number. Uh, we, as a department, track um, that sense of safety through our own uh, surveys we do internally for our business and community satisfaction surveys. Um, generally speaking, I think Vancouver is a little higher than that. Uh, but when you look at the Metro region and some of the things that are going on elsewhere in this area, that sense of safety does ebb and flow, depending on which community you actually speak to. Um, it, it's very much a gray area. Um, so as we proactively go out and um, take steps to promote safety, to, to drive people to become more aware of their surroundings, to provide um, personal safety seminars and what have you to some of the vulnerable groups in society, uh, I think what that does lend the broader spectrum to believe is that it, it is actually safer around them. They have a better sense of their own well-being and um, that trends uh, that uh, carries forward into how they feel about themselves and their environment around them. Um, you're right though, at the end of the day it is very subjective and we can only speak to the people and, and hopefully understand what it is that makes them feel unsafe and then deal with those problems where we can. Because actually, I feel pretty safe. You know, many years ago, um, you're talking about 10 years ago or so, almost every day you have a bank robbery and you don't hear that anymore. So uh, you feel pretty safe, but how to make people feel the same way as I feel that I feel safe in this city? Well, I'm not certain we can make people feel safe. Oh, okay. <laughs> it is a safe. Convince people or, or I understand what okay. you're saying. advocate. Yeah. Um, yeah, cr crime is going down. We've made some significant steps to reduce crime. And at the end of the day, that becomes the, the bellwether. Does it ever bottom out? I would suggest somewhere along the way it does. But as we sort of hit what I'm going to call plateaus, we keep looking for new and creative ways to, to further our position and, and, and take a, a further bite out of crime, so to speak, not to sound corny on that one. 
Let's add to that. And so the, the statistic that you're looking at is, of course, reported crime. So the, those are the crimes that, that people report. And, and uh, so it's always, um, there, there's always a, uh, it's not perfect either because we know that what some people don't report crime. People need to feel safe enough to be able to report a crime as well. And also in terms of the targets that we're looking at, it's sense of safety, it's also a sense of um, increased belonging or inclusion. Yeah, right. right. So those right. are the other things that we're looking at. And, as, and you know, the, our police have their job to do, but it's all of our jobs to make our city safe for everybody. So there's a lot of work being done, you know, at the community level to establish that sense of safety and that, the feeling of belonging and feeling of inclusion, whether it's even work that the city does around adequate lighting to our built environment, to making sure people are included in, in um, forums or can participate in some way in their community really does not help make them feel safe and help with their sense of safety. The other thing I wanted to mention is that there's a, a project that we're looking forward to seeing um, developed by women in the downtown east side that maps out and identifies um, for not only for the city but for other stakeholders and partners about feelings of safety, safety in that neighborhood and they feel that they have information that would be applicable not just to the downtown east side around women's safety but for women's, women's safety across the city. So those are the kinds of things that we need to learn more about and work together to implement. Councillor Tang, for the first time this term, I believe you are actually over time. So I'm going to get it. Councillor Deal, you are up next. Thank you very much. I've got three questions just to give heads up to staff. One on food, one on the arts, and one on active transportation, almost predictably. Um, first of all, around food. The neighborhood networks are something that I'm really interested in. And I just want to know if we could talk a little bit more about how those help to increase food security, especially in our neighborhoods that are underserved. They do a lot of work, of course, as you know. So in 2012, we know that you know 20,000 residents were participating in neighborhood food networks across the city, and we have 11 of them. And uh, the reality is, is that we could probably do with more because they, some of them cover a very broad uh, stretch of geography. They do a number of different things, uh, community kitchens, um, teaching people about food literacy and understanding nutrition. Um, community gardening, uh, doing things together, um, making sure that food gets distributed. Um, there was a, you know, a project where there was a food truck and uh, um, food being distributed through the West End to seniors that needed it the most in different neighborhoods. Uh, the idea of hosting what we call pocket markets where people can come and access fresh food at a lower cost at a social housing site, at a neighborhood house. Those are just examples of some of the things that um, that they are, they are doing to, to work on food security. Fantastic. So yeah. it's not just production of food, it's distribution, it's, and again, food literacy, how to cook it, how to store it, and then getting it to the Exactly. People. Dealing with food waste. We know Grandview Woodlands has a whole network of stores, grocery stores, with their leftover food, taking that, making it into meals, working with youth at Britannia Community Centre. They're doing wonderful, wonderful work. Great. Uh, just one more thing I just wanted yeah. to add there. What we heard during our consultation is that a lot of Vancouverites want to participate in neighborhood food networks because it provides them with a form of connection around food. And I had many people saying, I'd like to start up a community kitchen. I know people who eat alone, they're isolated, we want to come together. So I just thought I would add that in. That's perfect. That's, it's great for social interactions as well. Great. And um, thank you very much. Uh, on the art side, I see Ms. Proskin uh, looking alert. Um, <laughs> we know that, it, that, we know that uh, people feel good when they are consumers of art, when they observe it, when they, when they, when they experience art. Uh, but what are some of the benefits of actually being creative yourself, both in terms of brain development and, and the social aspects of being a creator as well as a, a consumer of creative things? Mm -hmm. Brenda Proskin, uh, General Manager of Community Services. Um, there is research that has proven that being engaged in some form of creative of uh, programming um, as well as a uh, business and services uh, really does allow people to do a lot of what food does. It actually nurtures the soul in many respects as well from being engaged, being involved and uh, actually a lot of social interaction that goes with it. We have many programs for example in the downtown east side that offer all kinds of uh, programming regarding um, outlets of sculpting to uh, painting to music. Um, it includes as well in our downtown
down south with our gathering place. So these programs are very well uh, attended and very much appreciated. And as you well know, it goes right across uh, this city to our public art program and people being engaged in all kinds of different ways and our partners in parks with a lot of the field house, and the pro field house artists and, and programs that they offer. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, active transportation. Mr. Dobervoni. <laughs> um, uh, there's some good data in here in terms of the mode share shift that we've experienced. Um, perhaps you can go in a little bit more detail than is in the report around the importance of safety for both uh, pedestrians and cyclists in terms of getting more women cycling and more children, in terms of seniors feeling safe as uh, perhaps as cyclists but certainly as pedestrians. Like sure. the, safe, the safety aspect of that. Great, thank you very much. Jerry Dobervoni, Director of Transportation. So there's been a number of, of studies that have uh, looked not only in Metro Vancouver but, but around North America. Um, you know, who, who are the people that are interested in, in walking and cycling more and what are the barriers that they face? Why are they not doing it more in safety? And, and, and cars are one of the major issues for cyclists. And, and so there's a lot of work in our Transportation 2040. Uh, we set new design standards and approaches so that we're, we're um, building facilities that directly relate to those fears and concerns uh, that the most likely to cycle um, people have. And, and we see that as being the biggest bang for the buck. And in terms of walking, it, it's a more complex picture, um, but it's intuitive as well. You know, good lighting, vibrant, but vibrant streets, uh, mixed use of uh, businesses and sidewalk cafes and all those things that uh, get people out on the street, that encourage more people to be on the street. And also um, connecting, we've had a theme in, in for all three of your questions around um, engaging people more in their community. And so uh, active transportation, both walking and cycling, are, are ways to um, have people connect better with their community, um, seniors in particular. And, uh, and we're studying, uh, we have a series of studies with UBC, with Coastal Health, and with a series of nonprofits to look at um, how the greenways that we produce, the active transportation corridors that encourage more walking and cycling, also allow people to be better connected with their community, um, better engaged with their neighbors, shopping locally, and spending more time in their neighborhood. Great. Councillor Deal, you are yep. at time. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, next up, Councillor Carr. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, yes, I have three questions, too. One around um, environments to thrive, the other around feeding ourselves, and the third around active living. So in terms of environments to thrive, I'm, I'm wondering, first of all, if there's been a doctor and a set, actually a set of doctors at St. Paul's really working on the built environment and healthy, a healthy built environment. Have we, I know that we've done some support with, uh, for them, but are we in communication with them and is there a, um, a plan for us to look at the more general built environment as what is healthier than not? Sorry, uh, <clears throat> Jerry's been here. I'll just put this down. Um, Councillor, uh, interestingly, um, our Provincial Ministry of Health is one of the first ministries I would venture, uh, certainly in the country and in the world, to actually have a document that speaks to built environment and it's important for health, which um, I think you might remember was presented at the conference at um, the uh, Dialogue Center, the WAS Center, some months ago. Um, so we have a lot of leadership across Vancouver Coastal and Providence around our health leaders, both physicians and other health researchers looking at uh, built environment. So we've got um, Larry Frank out at UBC, Heather, Heather McKay in the Hip Center for Health, um, who's, they've helped us on our, some of our greenway design to make it more amenable for seniors. And you know, physicians are around and about. So I would say we have, with planning, a fairly robust group of academics who are really helping us think about these things and learn about them. And, you know, one of the changes that we've made in the last few years is that we actually have some participation in CIHR research grants um, that's actually getting, leveraging research funding from, you know, our national organization to help, help uh, edu educate the city and to help our planners understand the strong links between health and the built environment. And I think our Transportation 2040 plan was the first time we actually ever had a health, major health goal as uh, a lead indicator and a goal for, um, for a transportation plan in the city. Okay, that, that's great. I really, I love the livable, uh, sorry, the walkable city notion, but I think there may be other um, elements of designing the built environment sure. that can come broad, forward around broad this. scope. Yeah, good. 
Okay, food assets. Um, I want just sort of also in the built environment, tree canopy. I'd love to see uh, addition of the tree canopy and as a measurement on that. And um, particularly, there are healthier trees than others in terms of tree species and the age of tree, the mature canopy, etc. Cleaning the air, cleaning the toxins out of the air. I mean that. Anyway, so our so urban so. forest strategy, which um, council has approved, is part of the greenest city goals and is you know will is obviously a big part of that and as you say it's a very important thing you'll remember that presentation that you know the health related to uh, a canopy and all of the benefits that provides you um, is not not to mention fruit trees and all right. the other kinds of ways there are sort of it's a fundamental part of all this work great thank you uh, food assets feeding ourselves um, there's a statement on page 23 of the, of the appendix that food assets are increasing in the city, and I'm um, not sure of that. And the reason I'm not sure is that we have measurements in the Greenest City Action Plan that talk about the number of new garden plots and community gardens and new community kitchens, etc. But I am, I do, I'm not aware of us tracking the loss of private backyard gardens, for example. Uh, but I do hear people come to council very upset about the shadowing of a building on a backyard garden. Their parents, their grandparents can't garden anymore or won't be able to. Do we have any plans to actually try and do a better job of inventorying for the backyard gardens and front yard side gardens that do exist? And also some screens that we could put in on development proposals that actually speak to the need to assess whether or not a development is going to negatively impact the food growing capacity of neighboring land. So it's a um, really important point, Councillor, and just a few things. Um, when we look at our, you know, if you look at well, what's taking up backyard gardens, um, you know, laneway houses, you know, houses that are able to be developed with a bigger footprint and then some of the older houses. Um, these are all issues. I think one of the unique things, and um, it, it actually is one of, one of the process points that's unique about the city of Vancouver, is that we, we run all our single family um, non-outright permits through a landscape, um, you know, a, a landscape arborist and architect in planning. Um, to actually look at green space landscaping and our tree bylaw. So we actually have a, a pretty comprehensive look at that. I think that we don't, we don't have regulation that requires if you have a, a food related garden that you've got to sustain it or anything like that. But I, I think we definitely have a filter that looks at these things. It, we are not, to my knowledge, actually tracking that piece, but it is something that we certainly have the ability to do. It, it goes through a screen in the planning and development services area where we could actually track it. And you will know that our policies and guidelines do look at um, you know, the amount of, of ground in any one development that is, you know, um, I've forgotten the technical term for it, but that, you know, that will absorb moisture and water and, and could be used for growing space. Like we do track that. You, you can't pave over your whole lot. There's a certain degree of absorption that needs to be there. So we have all these little connections. Um, I'm not aware that planning does actually track the square footage in that, but it'd be something to, to keep an eye on for sure. Uh, so you are also extremely well over time. So we'll move on to Councillor Meggs. Thanks. Um, I just have one question because I think a lot of this has been canvassed in many of the other plans that this now is integrating. But um, of course, we're all very interested in housing. Is it fair to say that the housing strategy may be the one that is most under the city's control and most decisive ultimately in, in producing better health? I mean, that's not to diminish the importance of the others, but for our, it's number two, I noticed the list right after children, so. Well, I think obviously um, housing is critically important and we we have a lot of levers and tools. We, we don't have, as you know, Councillor, uh, total control over, you know, our, the, the total destiny in Vancouver, but we, we're learning every day how to better use the leverage that we have. Um, and I think, um, you know, it's a big, big focus of concern for the city. But I think, you know, libraries, li lifelong learning, like really, if you look at the contribution, and perhaps um, Dr. Daly will be able to speak to this, but you know, access to an education, lifelong learning, literacy, you know, food, healthy food, 
um, social connectedness. We know for seniors, you know, social connectedness, as long as they have a roof over their head, is probably one of the most fundamental things for them to be healthy and active um, and have a quality life. So I think it's very hard to say one's more important than other. Um, the relative value is something that I'm sure the, the academics would probably argue over, but um, you know, we can, we, you can ask the same question to Dr. Daly when she speaks. Yeah, I guess so just following on uh, Dr. Jang, Councillor Jang's uh, comments that you know, we saw this evolution in, uh, in drug policy from supervised injection site to housing first, and it's so hard to get the other conversations going if someone's sleeping on the street. Exactly. You know? Yeah, it's very, very fundamental, not just to, um, you know, overall health, but even to bring the health services to them. It's very, very difficult. But, you know, when you get them into housing with the appropriate supports, um, We've seen time and time again, even in a shelter where you're giving them food and supports and access to primary care and a, and a supportive environment where they can have a shower and, you know, clean clothes. It's, it's so, those are the basic, you know, um, hierarchy of, of need and they, they need to be met for sure. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for your concise question, Councillor Meggs. Uh, next up, we have Councillor Bowe. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you very much for the report. It's, it's great to be able to read the aspirations of the whole community uh, over the next many years. Uh, one of the things I wanted to ask about, because I know in a lot of other cities have been doing this, is looking at the uh, effect of arts and culture, arts and culture building, the availability of arts and culture in neighborhoods and how they reduce crime. And I've been reading a lot of the studies that have been out there, and it's fascinating to just see how by spending money on culture, you actually lower money, lower the funds you're spending on crime and many of the other issues. And so I'm just, it, that wasn't mentioned in the report, and I think it would be a great tie-in as we go forward to get some of that research. Um, and because we know it does affect health, and now knowing how much it affects crime, I'm wondering if we're looking at that. Well, I think we certainly can. I mean, I think a lot of what is put into the strategy is trying to look at that upstream thinking so that we aren't dealing with things in a crisis level, but we're able to um, bring that kind of preventative lens um, and bring the livability into neighbourhoods as, as much as possible. So, um, and art through our community centres, through our neighbourhood houses, all those opportunities are very, very important, but we'll certainly take a look at that. And, and the research around those kinds of things is also important to us too, so thanks for mentioning that. That's great, yeah. thank you. I think just uh, another thing to add, um, Councillor Ball, is, you know, children and youth at risk. Mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of data around sport and recreation and how that can, you know, be, I think there's probably more public recognition of the importance of that, but there are many, many kids who, you know, for whatever reason, that, that's not their prime focus, but engaging them in arts and culture, music, um, you know, chorus, acting, performing, you know, we have some terrific young people in film school here who are learning skills that, you know, used to be much, much more advanced in your career to get them. So we know it, it's a, in terms of early intervention and vulnerable youth at risk, uh, arts and culture are really critically important. It would be great to see that documented. And just one other quick, quick thing, I want to comment on the mini libraries that are springing up in the neighbourhoods and their effect on the neighbourhood. We used to have car break-ins on our street all the time. And it's weird, when the little tiny mini library went up across the street and people started being there all the time to come to the library at all hours of the day and night, we stopped getting car break-ins. So it's a weird, tiny effect in a neighborhood when you, when you get a library having that big an effect. So I just want to say thanks to the libraries and all the little libraries out there. Yeah. Thank you. We have someone from the library here if you want to ask any specific questions, yeah. Councillor Ball. But. Um, I did have one quick question on, on libraries. Uh, when I was in New York, I saw a neighborhood library, which was a street front, front library, run by the library system. And I've now seen them in a couple of other cities uh, where they're, they're just small libraries that um, are available for seniors who can only walk a short, short way, not the 10 blocks or whatever that their library is there. But they're, they're sort of like laundromat <laughs> uh, libraries. And I'm just wondering if that's a possibility for the, they're low cost, they don't have a lot of books, but they do keep the books circulating. So I'm wondering if the libraries have been able to consider that. Thank you very much for your question. I'm Diana Gwynn with Vancouver Public Library. 
Uh, some of the uh, projects that we have experimented with this past year are pop-up libraries. Mm -hmm. So in the last uh, number of months and in the summer, we had three or four small pop-up libraries. We also <laughs> provided a library in the park when, we, when the Strathcona Library was closed during the summer when the school was closed. So we're not, no, we're not open every, every month in the summer. So we provided library service in McLean Park once a week. Mm -hmm. So those have shown us that there's an interest in, in bringing the library in whatever way we can to the community. Uh, you know, we have over 20 branches throughout the city. And we do try when we're developing new ones or, or renovating them. Uh, looking at where we are with respect to other neighborhood amenities, and if we are, I think it's mentioned in this in the uh, healthy city plan related to the walk score as in terms of an, an amenity and and um, where libraries are located with respect to community centers, etc. So I think we're 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 interested in seeing how the that neighborhood approach matches what our community is looking for. So I think we've, we have learned with the pop-ups that there's some, some interest. Uh, we do have to balance that with, with um, some of the other projects that we're doing. So we're, we're, we Council do keep an eye on the research. Councillor Ball, you are at time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, that just leaves me with questions. So I will, I will ask them. Um, my, three of mine are all process or on the sort of overall process. So the first one is around the coherence of targets when we have several action plans like Councillor Carr's comment about the canopy. Um, we have a well articulated goal um, with a target that we passed related to canopy in April of this year and yet it's not here, but it is in another document. So how are you reconciling? I, and I could bring up examples in the economic action strategy, the housing strategy. So can you speak to that a bit, how you integrate all these different targets? What we've tried to do as much as possible is integrate, um, if not targets, integrate indicator, indicators um, so that these things are aligned and we're not duplicating. Uh, there still may be some need for some cross-checking around that, particularly given the economic action strategies going through renewal, those kinds of things. Um, but we've, in as much as possible, that's what we've done is are those cross-checks between different strategies to make sure that we're measuring together as opposed to differently. Okay, so in the event that we pass this today, you, the plan is that staff will go away um, and develop the action plan and one of those um, broad activities that will happen is that kind of cross-checking. Yes, we will do that. Okay, um, and further to that um, action plan, if we had, I, I'm anticipating we might hear some specific tactical recommendations from different folks who've come to speak today. So not necessarily about changing the target, but about how we might reach the target. Um, I'm assuming the correct place for us to be inserting on tactics is in the action plan phase. That's right. Okay, so if people do provide tactic Tacti tactical advice today or advice on a tactic, um, you can connect with them and make sure that they're engaged in the action planning phase. We will do that. We'll receive okay. it for information. Okay, next question is around how some of the different um, uh, goal areas in uh, interplay. So the walk score, which I love that that would be a target, um, but I was noting on the map, um, it, you've described the downtown east side as a walker's paradise, which would not be the lived experience of most people trying to get across Powell or Hastings at um, rush hour. So while the built form supports walking, um, there still are some significant issues around speed and safety. Um, so, and then I note that's in another goal area. So can you speak a bit about how these um, will interplay together? I think what's really, really critical about the goal areas, as with social determinants of health, as with um, our rights as citizens, is that we need to look at these things as being overlapping, being very, very interconnected. So that's one of the beauties of the strategy. It's going to be one of our challenges. But that's, the, that's how we're going to be looking at it uh, in a more holistic way so that when we are looking at it, whether it's particular neighborhoods or particular goal areas, that we take these things into account. Okay. okay. And last question was content specific, although you're probably the right person to ask, it was related to the EDI scores. So 35% across the city, um, but wide variation between neighborhoods. So we have some as low as 18% and some over 50%. So how would the strategy respond to that? 
Well, those are, those are things that in terms of the tactical next steps, right? And we've heard different things. We've heard, uh, should there be a strategy across the city? Could we have something that would be more place-based? And not just focus on the goal of the good start in and of itself, but the goal of the good start with all of the other goals playing together. Because in the life of a child, there's an, obviously a need for connection and attachment with family, their need for uh, housing, for food, for school, all of these things come together. So those are being, there's, there's two different approaches there. One would be citywide, the other one could be potentially a neighborhood place-based kind of approach. Okay. Perfect, thank you. Okay, and with that, we are on to speakers. So we have um, two representatives from civic agencies and other government uh, bodies, and then we have nine registered speakers um, from the public. So we're going to start with the other government and civic agency representatives. First up is Dr. Patty, uh, sorry, Patricia Daly, Chief Medical Health Officer with Vancouver Coastal Health. Ms. Daly, I know you've been here before, but for the benefit of other speakers, um, you do have a, a maximum of five minutes at the microphone. Um, there is a timer to your left in front of you on the... Um, the, the desk in front of you there, um, which I'll get going. Uh, there might be questions from council afterwards, as you well know, Dr. Daly, and um, if you could stay at the microphone or podium for a minute, that would be great. Thank you, Madam Chair and Council, and I'm very pleased to be here today to support the Healthy City Strategy. You heard that in 2013, Vancouver Coastal Health signed a memorandum of understanding with the city with a vision of a healthy Vancouver for all. And we did this because we know that the work done by municipalities and the decisions made by municipal leaders such as yourselves can have a profound and lasting impact on the health of the population. Now, we all know responsibility for healthcare services in Canada rests with provincial governments, but cities in Canada and elsewhere in the world have a long history of making dramatic improvements in population health. And I'm going to digress and go back a bit further than Councillor Jang to talk about public health departments, which began as part of municipal governments in the 19th century with the recognition that clean drinking water and safe sewage disposal were essential to human health. Improved sanitation, building codes that improved ventilation and solid waste disposal led to, led to very dramatic reductions in communicable diseases in the 19th and early 20th centuries, even before antibiotics appeared. In the second half of the 20th century, with the recognition of smoking as the most important preventable cause of premature death, smoking bylaws such as the world leading bylaws introduced here in Vancouver have been shown to significantly reduce heart attacks in the population and to help reduce the risk of cancer and other chronic tobacco related diseases. So now here we are in the 21st century and we have identified the increasing incidence of obesity and diabetes, the rise in chronic disease prevalence, mental illness and the increase in dementia with our aging population and population health inequities as among our most important public health issues. The role of, address, of municipalities in addressing these problems may not be as obvious, but our 21st century researchers have shown that municipalities can play a critical role in both preventing and mitigating the harms of chronic diseases. Just one example, Dr. Larry Frank at UBC has shown that by designing walkable neighbourhoods, as you've been discussing, we know that by doing that, cities can increase physical activity and actually reduce obesity rates in the population and probably be more successful at it than I could be just by telling people to be more physically active. The Healthy City Strategy certainly delineates a very broad vision and comprehensive goals for, for health in the 21st century, and it may seem daunting. But the City of Vancouver has already been a leader in Canada in addressing those underlying determinants of health which do account for about 75% of the, of the population health that we all enjoy. A few examples, just in the time that I've been your medical health officer, you have recognized the importance of early childhood development in preventing mental illness and addictions, and you've invested in childcare spaces. You have recognized that housing and food are fundamental requirements for health, and led an expansion of social housing and created the Vancouver Street Food Strategy. You understand that physical activity can prevent many chronic diseases, and you've expanded biking infrastructure and recreational opportunities. You've expanded smoking bylaws to include patios, parks, beaches, and most recently e-cigarettes, and you're a, a North American leader in taking that stand. And you are the only municipality in Canada to date to support a Four Pillars Addiction Strategy that includes not only comprehensive harm reduction services, but the first supervised injection site in North America. 
These are only a few examples. In fact, as you've heard and been discussing, much of the day-to-day -day work of city staff and council will improve the health of the population you serve. The Healthy City Strategy brings together much of this work that we know is already underway in Vancouver, but also describes those important determinants of population health with goals and targets for each. For some of these goals, the city can play a direct role through your own policies, programs, and services. For others, your role will be one of influence and advocacy. And that's why the last goal on collaborative leadership may be one of the most important by bringing together leaders from public, private, and civil sectors to address the determinants of health. And you've already started to do that with the le leadership table for the strategy. At Vancouver Coastal Health, we are committed to working with you to achieve the goals in the strategy by providing expertise, data, and I'll remind you of the My Health, My Community survey we just completed, which will provide a comprehensive picture of the population health in Vancouver. We had over 10,000 respondents in Vancouver, 33,000 in the Lower Mainland. We'll be able to give you neighborhood-level population health data to help monitor the success of the strategy. And we also have a, a strong commitment to work with you to ensure that the services we provide in the Health Authority support your vision and goals. So I'd like to thank the, the city staff for the tremendous work you've done to develop a strategy to date and Mayor and Council for your leadership. Thank you. Thank you. That was an extraordinarily well-timed speech. Um, you, do have, um, you do have some questions from Councillor Carr. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Davey, for, for your involvement in, uh, with this city in a healthier city. Um, I have a question around uh, the point you made early in the earliest part of your presentation around um, avoiding or preventing chronic uh, diseases and particularly amongst children. I've done a lot of reading around nature deficit disorder um, amongst children and, uh, and the fact that uh, more children can play outdoors uh, in physically active ways, um, the better. How does the city encourage that? How, what do we do to, to increase um, children's physical activity and outdoor green spaces? Well, you've already done a lot by some of your strategies to increase green space, but it is a challenge, and I'll just uh, give you a challenge that we have in Vancouver Coastal Health. As we look at the need for the child care facilities, for example, uh, there are regulations that uh, require a certain amount of outdoor play space for those facilities, but in, as we increase density in the city, it can be very difficult, and we're trying to balance the need for child care with that need for outdoor play spaces. I think the, what we need to do are work with uh, those who work in early child care, so those uh, uh, child care providers, certainly with our schools, and I think this is... Um, one of our priorities in Vancouver Coastal Health, we do want to increase physical activity. And I think you're absolutely right that you want to start in childhood because not only is that beneficial to, to brain development, to learning, but it will set people on a lifelong path to be physically active. So I think working with the school board is going to be critically important. I'd like to see uh, the school board uh, work with the health authority to establish um, a daily physical activity for all students, for example, and how we might support them in doing that. So there are a number of strategies that I think that we can use. It's not just about green space. It's working with those who are already interact with children at all ages. Yeah, I, I, I was actually quite shocked. Well, I've, I've heard it before, but it just came home again um, to read in this report about over like almost a third of children are not ready uh, for kindergarten and school system and I'm wondering if you have done any analysis on whether or not some of that relates to just that that physical activity the you know the the kind of um, yeah just the physical activity and the physical development and sort of the the release from screens <laughs> video screens and TVs etc well the, you're talking about the early development index and and vulnerability and uh, uh, physical uh, readiness uh, is one of the domains that's looked at among children if they're, um, how coordinated they are when they start school, for example. So it's certainly one area that's important for that early childhood development, but it's complicated. And the question that came up before about looking at um, differences in neighborhoods, we don't completely understand uh, differences in vulnerability between neighborhoods, what we might do to improve that, but we are working very closely with the, probably the world experts on this at the Human Early Learning Partnership at UBC to try and understand what things we can put in place 
uh, whether it's improving opportunities for physical activity, engaging uh, women starting in pregnancy so that they can, uh, they can, we can start them on a path to healthy early childhood development even before their child is born, uh, whether it's more child care with better trained people. There, there are strategies that we want to look at and work with them to evaluate what might be most successful. And, and the city is involved in, in those discussions with Great. those researchers. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Carr. Uh, next up, we have Councillor Deal. Hi. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, quick question on resources. Um, we know, for instance, that it's, it's much less expensive to house someone and give them support than to deal with them through emergency services. In terms of health, uh, what is the sort of relative resources that are required to prevent uh, ill health as opposed to treat or try to cure it? Well, you know, it depends on the, on the disease you're looking at, the strategy you're looking at. There are some preventive strategies that we know are highly cost effective. Some will even save the healthcare system um, uh, real dollars, such as um, prenatal care, immunizing children. Uh, we know many of the things we do are highly cost effective in public health. The supervised injection site, for example, because it prevents HIV infections, overdose deaths, and other things. But um, a lot of the strategies for improving health still require an investment. I think uh, one of the challenges we have is we have to make the case for why uh, investments in strategies that will promote health and prevent disease may be a higher priority than our, our, our current health care system, which is so, focused so much on treating people with disease and illness. And this is something that I know our provincial government is interested in. They've, they've talked about the unsustainable rise in, in health care costs, which take almost a, a half of our budget now, and those are mainly for acute care services. And yet we know those services are only responsible for about 25% of population health. So yes, we, we, we know cost of some strategies are more cost effective than others. We want to choose those, but it's still going to require a conscious decision by the population, by leaders, to move some of the resources we may be spending in one area to others that may be imp more important for population health. Thank you very much. And thank you for all of your... If we have a copy of your notes, that's a great list of stuff that we've done. I'm sure we have that all somewhere, but that's a, you've compiled it extremely well. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Councilor Deal. Uh, Mayor Robertson also had some questions, Dr. Daly. Thank you, Dr. Daly, uh, for being here and for all of your work, not only on this, but uh, the, that long list of, uh, of leadership that the city's taken for many years. Uh, you've been right there at the table for a lot of those initiatives and encouraging us and supporting us. So thank you for all your work and all your colleagues uh, at Coastal Health. Uh, it's been a huge support for us, so we really appreciate that. And I. Um, I want to just shift to, uh, given the opportunity of having you here, and given uh, the more acute end of the spectrum and everyone's worries globally right now with Ebola virus, um, the, talking about the acute end of the spectrum uh, and, this, uh, and how important it is to have a comprehensive plan like this for healthy cities, but maybe speaking to um, a crisis that emerges and the resilience uh, that, that is required in that situation, but the city's readiness for uh, an epidemic. We went through the, through the episode a couple of years ago uh, when um, the H1N1 mm -hmm. uh, right. emerged, yeah. and it was kind of a, well, it felt like a bit of a practice run at the time anyway. It didn't, it didn't end up uh, nailing us in the, in the way that it might have, but given the, the current threat, can you just speak to maybe connecting the dots between the Healthy City strategy and, and these kind of crises that are emerging globally? Sure. And first let me say that the best way to reduce our risk of Ebola is to support the efforts in West Africa to control the outbreaks there. Um, having said that, um, I know there's uh, fear, particularly I think among uh, healthcare workers in, in our city because uh, they've seen what's occurred in both in West Africa and with the imported case in Dallas in the United States and the two healthcare workers who became infected. Um, I can tell you what, no cases in Canada right now. Uh, we may not get a case, we may, but we, uh, I'm confident that if uh, a traveler were to arrive here uh, and come down with Ebola, that we have a health care system that, that's very prepared to isolate and provide excellent care to uh, that potential patient while maintaining the safety of our health care workers. And we have a public health system uh, that will, um, will uh, follow up any uh, who may be at risk from contact with that case. And, and you have to remember, this is not a disease that's easily transmitted. Health care workers are at higher risk because they have contact with very sick patients uh, and the transmission is through infected blood and body fluids. Others at risk are close family contacts, but there's no community risk if you get an isolated case of Ebola that might arrive 
uh, for example, in the city of Vancouver. I think um, the Public Health Agency of Canada has excellent guidelines in place. Uh, they're now, uh, they have quarantine officers at Vancouver Airport, for example, that identify any um, returning travelers from affected countries who've been there within the previous 21 days. All those returning travelers will be monitored by public health authorities. Uh, so as soon as they develop symptoms, we can make sure that they're tested and managed appropriately. And as I said, um, our, our hospitals have been preparing. I can also tell you that um, 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 Vancouver Coastal Health staff met with staff from the city this week, including uh, your uh, representatives from your fire department who are first responders. And of course, we, we want to be sure our first responders who may be involved in transporting a potential case who might arrive are prepared as well. And we will be including uh, one of your emergency planners, Kirsten Jasper, in some of our uh, planning activities with Vancouver Coastal Health. So we'll maintain that link with the city. But I'm confident that we'll be prepared in the unlikely event that a case were to arrive here. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks, Mayor Robertson. That is it for questions. Thank you, Dr. Daly. Uh, next up, we have Carolyn Brooks, who's here on behalf of the Vancouver Public Library in her role as the Vice Chair of the Library Board. Good okay. morning, um, Council. Carolyn Brooks, uh, Vice Chair of Vancouver Public Library Board. First of all, um, I wanted to Thank you for allowing me to be here on behalf of the Vancouver Library Board. Um, we see that the Healthy City Strategy presents a thorough look at the many determinants of individual and community health. And we're really delighted, especially, that the um, public library system played a strong role in the development of the lifelong learning pillar. Um, we'd like to underscore that lifelong learning and free access to information and things like public learning spaces literacy development opportunities and research assistant, assistance pardon me, are underpinnings for many of the other pillars in this strategy. So we just want to say that they're foundational elements. Um, as such, the public library plays a critical role across many of the areas of the Healthy City strategy. For example, things like reading readiness for preschool children, settlement and integration for newcomers to our city, health literacy, financial literacy, job search strategies, computer training, literacy support. We have, of course, internet access, which helps bridge the digital divide. Safe spaces for community members. Programs that connect and engage members of our city, which we know is so important. These services and roles stretch across every pillar of the Healthy City Strategy. There was a recent um, Pew Center for Internet Life research that showed that public libraries are the most trusted community institutions across America. They're neutral, we're neutral, we're free to use, and we're not trying to advance any particular agenda. Everyone can feel comfortable using us. Um, we're just there to help people advance their aspirations. So we're really pleased to see this strategy, and in closing, I would like to commend the city for filling out its strategic ecosystem so that the social development walks alongside economic development and environmental health. Thank you very much. You have questions from Councillor Deal. Sorry. <laughs> you look excited to have those questions. Okay. I'm so um, excited to hear from Councillor <laughs> Deal. <laughs> <laughs> what can I ask her? Um, thanks for coming out and thanks for your volunteer work on the board. I know you're a dedicated and passionate person about libraries as well as an author. Um, the uh, the way that people learn and the way that people are literate is, is obviously is evolving over many years. Can you describe a little bit of the um, in innovation lab work that's being done so that we we are addressing these changes and how we define and and, and uh, develop literacy? You know, don't we, I see a look to staff. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking that I can certainly talk about it, but I'm also thinking that Diana Gunn might give uh, a more comprehensive answer to yeah. your question. Because, because the libraries are evolving, learning is evolving, and literacy is evolving. Yeah, we're not just places for books. Yeah. Um, you know, books are still really important. I believe that, but, um, and we, we all believe that, but we also are innovating along with um, other strategies. So let me pass over to Diana. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, were you referring as, uh, especially to the Inspiration Lab? Sorry, I said innovation. I meant okay. inspiration, yeah. yes. Okay, so uh, yes, the... Um, the Inspiration Lab is in uh, development, and we're hoping it'll be 
or we are planning to have it open in early 2015. And for those of you that may not know, it's a, a lab that will be uh, in place on the uh, fifth floor of the library. And it will involve uh, various types of technology and um, uh, spaces for individuals to learn in all kinds of different ways. So sound recording, uh, digital stories, uh, computer use, uh, graphics for all ages. So your particular question was just the how... How does that fit into the development of literacy as, it, as that definition evolves? Oh, sure, sure. So uh, when we talk about uh, literacy in the um, lifelong learning goal, we're talking about all kinds of literacy. So, uh, and we believe as the public library that we have a role to play in certainly in early learning literacy, adult literacy, health literacy, and digital literacy. So through the Inspiration Lab, along with our various programs that we offer, that we're already doing, like one-on-one -on -one, uh, tech cafes, uh, intergenerational learning with teens and seniors using computers, definitely it's a, it's a, it's a pillar within the lifelong learning. Fantastic. And a second question for either one of you is, since we're inspired already by the Inspiration Lab, is the Inspiration Pass. And perhaps uh, you could uh, just briefly describe that, that pass system, and, because it ties into so many parts of this Healthy City strategy. Yes. Okay. So that's also mentioned in the, in, I think, in the, um, uh, in the cultural uh, arm of the lifelong learning. So the Inspiration Pass is a pass that enables individuals who can uh, gain access to a variety of cultural um, amenities throughout the city, including the opera, also um, science world, uh, uh, parks and rec facilities. And you can uh, apply for the, an inspiration pass through obtaining a library card. So we've we set up an agreement with various organizations around the city. And once you have a library card, you can place a hold on uh, gaining access to one of the uh, amenities through the Inspiration Lab, and it's primarily geared for individuals and families who may not otherwise have access to, to those amenities. So that's how it's worked. It's very popular. It, there's a waiting list all the time for those. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Councillor Deal, you do also have questions from Councillor Ball. Madam Chair, and which, again, whichever one of you care to answer, what do you see as your greatest challenges in providing uh, the services you have now and in the future? Like, just briefly, what are you, you seeing as, as the sort of the stumbling box here? Um, I think that a lot of our challenges have to do with funding. Mm -hmm. And um, we want to provide more services and we want to be more um, accessible to more of Vancouver's population. We see our role as being really important in that. But um, budget-wise, um, just in terms of the amount of money that we that that you know um, the city is is able to um, to leverage for that 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 continues to be a challenge for us mm -hmm. and um, and we continue to to try and work with within those parameters I guess is the best way to put it. So budget is is obviously a large one. Is, are there other any other uh, challenges that you see as you move forward? Um, uh, the other challenges are just the, the um, uh, trying to keep an eye on um, all of the various aspects of library service for the whole wide range of our population. Uh, certainly you, we've mentioned them in the learning, in the uh, Healthy City Strategy, uh, the aging population, the vulnerability of children, uh, reaching out to teens, reaching out to new Canadians. So uh, how we balance our, our uh, time through balancing our collections and our programs and our public spaces. So it's they're challenges, but they're also what we're here for. So I think it's just it's um, spending enough time and how to allocate our budget to what's the most important. But I think the the healthy strategy, healthy city strategy overall is so lined up with everything we're we're all about that um, if we can if if the strategy is is supported, I think that'll help us uh, and our library board advocate for what it is that we're we're here for. Money and time. <laughs> Money and time, and and um, uh, just and reaching out to those pockets of the population that that maybe we're we're not uh, reaching as well as we'd like to. Great. Thank you for coming in today. Thank you. Thank you. That's it for questions. Thank you very much. Okay, we are on to the resident speakers list, which starts with Catherine Ludgate, who's here on behalf of Van City as the manager of community investment.
No problem. Okay. Um, could I, Leslie, do you mind helping out with the video? video if that's okay. Yeah. Um, equivalent of creating financial access and inclusion. The minimum wage. Thank you. is the legal minimum provincially set that each employee has to be paid and also it's based on a single's income. The living wage is based on a family's income, two parents working full time and two children and it's based on what it actually costs that family to be able to cover their basic expenses, clothing, housing, transport, childcare, food, etc. Our recertification today has impacts both short, medium and long term. In, in the short term, the effect has been, well, we raised the, the wage for about 50 of our direct staff that we discovered weren't being paid a living wage. We worked with our suppliers for direct labor services, janitorial security, and have improved the, uh, improved the financial position of all of those folks that provide labor services. A happier worker is more productive. You can eat and sleep properly knowing that your bills are getting paid and that you can make your rent on time. 1,200 suppliers, but we started off with our strategic suppliers. The, the kind of suppliers that are a bit more vulnerable to only receiving close to a minimum wage. People that clean our buildings, that cater for us, that provide security. It's going to make uh, things a lot easier for me for transportation costs, living costs, my rents, my grocery shopping, and then looking after my mom. So there's a real domino effect from, you know, we have 1,200 suppliers, they talk to other people, great impact through that. We really believe the most important contribution we can make to the campaign, it's not the 50 employees here at Van City or, or the 100 contractors that were affected, but as we can share out and encourage other employers to join this campaign, then we start to affect the lives of, of thousands of people. And that's one of the reasons it's so important to our board and we're so proud of Van City for being certified and now recertified as a living wage employer. We budgeted a million dollars this year annually. It'll cost us about 700000 you know, on a $300 million operating budget. It's pretty small. I think for 500,000 members, though, they can be so proud to say that they do their banking at a, an organization that is actually trying to reduce poverty. I'm a member at Van City. I do my banking with them. And, um, and this does make me a, 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 proud, a prouder member. So I'm sorry, the sound was better when we practiced this morning before anyone came in. Um, I, and and I'll, I'll hit some of the points in there. So thanks for this opportunity to address the, the really great healthy city strategy for the City of Vancouver. I'm Catherine Ludgate and I work as a manager in the community investment team at the Credit Union where I'm responsible for our support of and implementation of various anti-poverty strategies including the living wage. So I'm here to speak to you employer employer, I, yes, about a tactic, and about why the city should see the living wage as integral to the healthy city strategy, particularly to goal number five, adequate income for all. So why, why should a municipality wade into territory that might seem to be the purview of more senior government? The living wage is a voluntary market response by public and private sector employers that addresses the gap, frankly, in, in public policy. It's a response to public policy failure at more senior levels of government. Um, it's something you can do as a municipal government and the, and the mayor asked about this. It's actionable, it's within your control, it's implementable and it fills that policy gap um, that is uh, a void at senior levels of government. Becoming a living wage employer is not hard or complicated to do but it does take the determination to work through issues around contract work. For the city, frankly, probably 98% of your employees now are already paid a living wage through the, through the QP contracts and any other directly employed staff that aren't covered by union agreements are probably above the living wage. For Van City and for you, the real work and the real value is in the work with contractors like Mike, our security guard in the video, who got a $6 an hour bump and what he was saying was it had actually tremendously increased the quality of his life because now he could make food choices and he could support his mom. 
Our experience, like other living wage employers, is that the incremental increase in the cost is minimal. Ellen Peckley, who was on the leadership table, said there it cost us 700000 That's on a $325 million budget, effectively a rounding error. For New West, the additional cost has been one quarter of 1%. And uh, the councillor there, Jamie McAvoy, says that's handily funded by the increasing tax base derived from property revenues, so no net increase to taxation. But as a large employer, the effect of paying a wage doesn't have much of a monetary effect on our own workers, our directly uh, employed workers. The real benefit is when we get at those contractors, particularly in sectors where workers are vulnerable, where we start to see and start to change supply chains by demanding that we get living wage suppliers. And we want to work with the City of Vancouver on that. We want you in the campaign with us. That's where we think the real leadership opportunity is and where the healthy city strategy can help meet the goals of adequate income for all in the City of Vancouver. Thanks. Thanks. Very concise comments. Oh, and of course, you've got some questions from Councillor Carr. Here she goes. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank, you know, that's a great statistic to know. 700000 is what it cost you, but what an impact on lives. Thank you for giving that information. Um, and uh, I'm just um, wondering if you are uh, asking us to become a, a living wage employer in the city. I, I'm asking you to think of it in the Healthy City Strategies. The staff rolls out its plan to think of it as one of the many important tools that may be used. Uh, to, to meet goal five, adequate income for all. So I'm not here today asking the council to make that commitment, but I'm asking it to give staff permission to work through what it would take to implement a living wage. Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. That's it for questions. Thanks for coming. Thanks for the video. Next up we have uh, Deanna Ogle, Living Wages for Families campaign, and I'm sorry if I got your last name wrong. No, you did it perfectly. Awesome. Okay. Okay. Welcome. Thanks. So thanks for providing me um, with the opportunity to speak. Um, so my name is Deanna Ogle and I'm the campaign organizer with the Living Wage for Families campaign. And I'm passionate about the Living Wage for Families campaign. It's one of my own memories um, from my childhood is my mother very proudly taking me out for supper and my family out for supper after she was hired onto a position that paid a living wage. So the experience of having sustainable work is transformative for families. And the city of Vancouver has an incredible opportunity to play a leadership role in making that change. So the Living Wage for Families campaign is hosted by First Call BC and the Child and Youth Advocacy Coalition. Um, so much like my own story, the story of child po poverty is a story of low-wage work. In 2011, which is the most recent year for which we have data, one out of every three poor children lived in families where at least one adult had full-time, full-year work. And a majority lived in families with some paid work, so part-time or part-year. And Canadian researchers have reported that family income plays a significant role in influencing child development. So of the 27 factors identified as having an impact on child development, up to 80% were seen to improve as family income increased. So the living wage calculation is a bare bones calculation, uh, which tries to take into account um, the cost of two adults working full time um, to raise two young children in our communities. The living wage in Metro Vancouver, as you saw in the video, is $20.10 an hour and is calculated as a total compensation package for employees, so wage and non-mandatory benefits. In calculating the cost for a family of four in Metro Vancouver, we take into account the cost of rent, major household expenses, childcare, healthy food, and transportation. It doesn't include costs that many low-wage workers face, like debt repayment. It also doesn't include saving for retirement or saving for children's education. Many of the costs that go into the living wage calculation are fixed costs. So, um, for example, we estimate a very conservative $1,300 a month rent for a three-bedroom apartment. Um, the variable that we see existing um, in people's lives, in the lives of low-wage workers, is time. So we see that families are placed in impossible situations of taking on a second or a third job to cover costs, that parents are skimping on food for themselves, and most importantly, from the perspective of a healthy city strategy, families are reducing um, their ability to fully participate in the community they live in. When our campaign meets with low-wage workers, one of the things we often ask is, what would you do if you made a living wage? How would that change your life? And the answer is almost always related to community inclusion. 
when individuals we talk to, um, when we ask that question, their answer is always, I would take my kids to the movies. I would have my kids participate in arts and athletic programs. Um, and then, of course, they also talk about the reduced stress of being able to pay their bills and worry less about money. Um, the benefit and the challenge, and Catherine really outlined this, is of a municipality um, instituting a living wage policy is that it not only applies to direct staff, but includes major contractors. Um, so a living wage policy does have costs attached. And what we've seen with the city of New Westminster and with Van City is that costs were not as high as initially expected, and there were many unexpected benefits. So by researching and looking into the possibility of having a living wage policy, you're allowing the city to kind of walk the talk and create an immediate change in the economic well-being of people living in our community. It's an excellent tool for poverty reduction. Paired with a strong advocacy for a comprehensive province-wide poverty reduction plan, it can demonstrate a real commitment to the healthy city, city strategy goal of making ends meet and working well. So I would encourage the city to, to work with the community of support provided by the living wage campaign and investigate, investigate the costs and opportunities provided by a living wage policy. So thank, thank you me. very much for your time today. You don't have any questions. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Al Edmansky here on behalf of himself, according to my notes. Good afternoon. Good morning. Still morning. Um, that. Thanks for giving me the opportunity, oh, uh, they're, Al. They're just going to raise the podium so the microphone's a little okay. closer to you. How high can they go? Um, uh, Al Atmansky, uh, and I'm um, one of the uh, co-chairs of BC Partners for Social Impact, which was uh, one of the slides quoted by uh, Mary Claire when she gave you her presentation. I think I can also safely say that I'm the tallest member of the, uh, of the leadership table. Uh, I've been part of, <laughs> of lots of those meetings, processes, dialogues, and convenings uh, over the years, uh, uh, particularly in involving government. I don't think I've ever quite experienced the degree of enthusiasm, energy, and zest associated with it. So you probably know that already, but you've got an incredible team of staff. And instead of bottoms in seats, uh, people were jumping out of their seats uh, around that table. And so you're on to something here. This is something that I think not only your staff can get behind, uh, but your city, our, our city as well. Um, there were three other noteworthy things about this process for me. One, uh, there was a recognition that not all of the things that we've done before have worked. Uh, that seems obvious, but you know, we keep doing the same old things even though they don't work. And so there was a very strong clarity and understanding that we're going to have to not only preserve the best of the approaches to social innovation and social change that have worked, but we also have to open our minds and our methods to new approaches. To some extent, in the work I do, we're, uh, you know, we're to a large extent in the uh, dial-up technology era uh, as it relates to social change, social innovation, and making improvements in our city when, in fact, uh, we, are, we have gravitated to a smartphone area. So there's that shift from, if you will, dial-up technology. And I was very appreciative of Councillor Reimer coming out and addressing a World Congress on Social Innovation that took place in, um, in early May in Vancouver where we had a chance to show the world that we know how to not only make change but make profound change that has cultural impact. Um, second uh, element uh, of this strategy that I think is very important is uh, it's almost a, an evolution in the way governments do policy. So I think what, what I took uh, as being a citizen was that the city was saying we can't do it alone and neither can you. The only way we're going to make the change that needs to be made is by doing it together. Now I know that's trite and that's used a lot, but the reality is that the evolution of policy so that it's co-created, co-produced, and where the city plays a catalytic role and doesn't have to do everything for everyone, but in fact puts the wind under the sails of the amazing talent and creativity and achievements that are already 
in place in this city and that maybe need to spread, and that's the role. So very, very appreciative of that element. Um, and thirdly, there is a theme going through this, which has come up uh, from Council as they've, uh, as they've commented on the report and from previous speakers. And I think it's the recognition that uh, all of these individual items and goals in the overall strategy are to a higher purpose. The aspiration is that we have a city in which everyone belongs and in which everyone uh, can make a contribution. And uh, I just came back from a week on Haida Gwaii and studying the incredible uh, and profound resilience that exists uh, in that nation. And I've come to understand that uh, if we are to be a city where everyone belongs and everyone, um, everyone contributes, then we are in effect taking the statement you made yesterday around reconciliation and applying it to all of these items. So I'm happy to be part of this and congratulations for uh, this amazing piece of work going forward. Thank you. Thank you. You have no questions, but I did want to offer my thanks. I know you put a lot of time in at the leadership table level and help connect us to these networks that you're connected to around the province and country and world that have brought a lot of um, a lot of a lot to the both experience, knowledge, understanding, best practice, and then just the human relationships that have informed a lot of this work. Thank you. Okay, next up, Gail Berger. And after Ms. Berger, we'll have um, Deborah Littman and Scott Clark. I'm Gail Berger, representing Metro Vancouver Alliance. <laughs> Lower the platform. <laughs> Oh, better, yes. Yes, uh, Gail Berger from Metro Vancouver Alliance. I'm a resident of the West End and also a member of Gloria Day Lutheran Church is how I've gotten involved in Metro Vancouver Alliance since the Alliance deals only with uh, our membership or groups, not individuals. You've already heard the specifics about living wage, about the 2010 an hour. Uh, let me give you one anecdote of why our community groups are valuable in this and how we can work to change a lot of people's minds about these issues. Two weeks ago I gave a forum at Gloria Day and I listed all the issues about living wage, what it covered, all of these things and my people in my community and my congregation were quite shocked because they grew up in a very different era where the cost of things was very much different. And as, for example, I grew up in a working class family and we took vacations, we uh, did all kinds of things, we had activity, all of those things as a result of being unionized as well. My father with a union job. Okay, and we know the obvious issues of poverty, that people cannot make it in our society if they don't make enough money. The living wage requires t two adults working uh, if a family of four, both the couple making 2010 an hour. What I bring to you as something about who will support this living wage, uh, I thank Ms. Carr and Mayor Robertson, uh, along with Kirk LaPointe and Mina Wong, of supporting the living wage idea at the Metro Vancouver uh, Election Accountability Assembly. About, beyond that, though, our groups support them. We are faith, labor, and uh, community groups. You're looking at many, many thousands of people who are willing to support this and support further that Vancouver become a living wage city. That is to encourage other employers to become living wage employers as well. And I think that's basically what I want to say at this point. You've gotten all the specifics from other people. But to simply say that we support you, Metro Vancouver Alliance groups support the idea of living wage. Thank you, Ms. Berger, and sorry to mispronounce your last name. Um, Councillor Carr has some questions. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you, and thank you very much for the Metro Van Alliance um, 
accountability session. Uh, and it, it was pretty exciting to see everyone on stage supporting um, the Councilor living way. Carr, Councillor Carr, I just, I should have intervened in the thing, but we, we are um, prohibited from bringing election campaign discussions into this room. So we'll, we'll just stick to the subject matter. I, thank you. Um, so in terms of the follow-up uh, to your suggestion that Vancouver pursue it, an earlier speaker, um, Ms. Ludgate, suggested um, uh, getting staff or giving staff leave to investigate this. Mm -hmm. Is that, would that be your, um, your suggestion or is there some other suggestion you would have in terms of how Vancouver uh, might pursue this and what council can do to um, help that happen. I, I think that would be a possibility. The other thing would be for Vancouver to s consult New Westminster, which has had the living wage, our living wage employers. And keep in mind that also includes not just city staff, but also contractors and subcontractors that would not, you would not hire once it did not pay living wage. And so that, I would agree, would, would be one of the things to do as well. Great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks. Um, I actually have a quick question sure. on this as well. So in the document, um, there is a goal to make ends meet and work well, mm -hmm. and then there's an indicator to reduce poverty and increase median income, and then there, sorry, I'm getting the hierarchy wrong, and then there's an indicator, number five, living wage. So mm -hmm. it, it is articulated in the document. Is that, I see you're saying that you support that articulation? Mm -hmm. Yes, I okay. do. Okay, yeah. perfect. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, next up we have Deborah Lippman, Scott Clark, and then Nicholas Chernin. Um, hello, I'm Deborah Lippman. I'm the lead organizer of Metro Vancouver Alliance. Um, and I just want to commend Council for taking a leadership on this issue. I think the four issues that arose out of the uh, listening campaign that are 50 member organizations and these are organizations that really do cross the civil society spectrum from faith to labor to community to educational institutions. Uh, the four issues that arose as our top priorities were um, poverty, affordable housing, uh, affordable and accessible transit and social isolation. So this strategy really does weave all of those together and we would certainly like to uh, play a, a, as big a role as we can in supporting what you're doing. Um, I think that there are just two quick points I want to make. I've been involved personally in living wage campaigns uh, uh, across uh, several countries. Uh, this idea of living wage came out of a sister organization of ours in Baltimore. It then moved across the states. There are about 120 organizations in the U.S. that have in one way, cities uh, ha have in one way or another implemented living wage policies. And in the UK, uh, a very major uh, plan um, was adopted by London, by the city of London, so that London has had an official living wage since 2004, uh, supported by both mayors that have been in place and um, implemented now with 700 uh, civil uh, employers both in the nonprofit and uh, for-profit sector that have adopted it, including major banks, uh, finance industry, retail firms, um, universities, museums across the board. 20% uh, of all uh, local authorities in the UK have a living wage strategy. Wellington in New Zealand has adopted one. So you'd be in very good company um, uh, implementing a living wage policy and there would be a great deal of help in terms of the implementation uh, that you could draw on from other cities. Um, I just want to make one quick point which is about civil society. Um, it's very easy often to look, at, look to agencies and specialists and experts to help in this. I think our experience is that there is a huge amount of knowledge um, and expertise in civil society organizations, sometimes very small, sometimes quite they may, might appear quite marginal to you, but um, these are the organizations that really have the grassroots connections. And as I say, we have 50 actually now, 51 uh, organizations, uh, Raycam Community Center just joined. So we have a lot of ability to reach deep into communities and to provide you with the uh, connections and feedback and ideas that will help implement this strategy. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lipman. There are no questions for you. 
Thanks. Okay, we've got Scott, Scott Clark, Nicholas Chernin, and Joel Brownstein with Brendan Bailey as our last speaker. Now, I don't think I've seen Scott today. No, I, we haven't seen Scott today, so we'll just put him on the at the end if he shows up. Uh, so that makes Nicholas Chernin the next speaker, followed by Joel Brownstein. Thank you very much for having me here today. Um, and uh, I'm here speaking as a citizen of Vancouver. Um, and I've, I've spent a number of hours going through uh, the Healthy Cities report. Uh, and I would say thank you to city staff um, and the city staff that included members of the community to be a part of this. Um, it looks like a tremendous amount of work and time. Uh, went into it. Um, full disclosure, I, I am running um, in this election and uh, I've been working hard at looking at what the city does and how it operates over the last couple of years, so it's caused me to look at things a lot more closely. And so I might be the one detractor um, from this uh, report and strategy uh, because I, I look specifically at things there are a lot of great ideas in here, um, but it's the intention behind it that backs it up to actually make these uh, key suggestions um, deliverable. And so I was going to work on doing a, a comprehensive speech and, and write it out. And um, I, I was sort of stopped dead in my tracks because on the second to last page of the strategy as it's uh, presented towards you, uh, for you today. The third paragraph from the top um, talks about uh, the city recognizes that other levels of government, organizations, and individuals must all take action in order to achieve the vision of a healthy Mr. city for all. Um, yeah? Just because everybody's flipping around here, are you talking about the staff report or the I'm actual appendix? About, sorry. Uh, the policy report. The policy report. Policy. Okay, if yeah. people are looking for that. Sorry, second to last page, second third last paragraph. Page. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, so later in that third paragraph, it goes to 10 individuals who provided innovative ideas were selected to participate in social innovation events. I guess a question that I would have if there's a staff person here is who were those 10 individuals that were selected and how were they selected? The reason that I'm asking the question is because the Think Creative Leadership uh, Organization the cost to send one person to one of their um, leadership programs is 35,000 euro. And 10 people were selected. Now, they have lots of different programs. So I don't know if this was a weekend program, if it was a month-long program, an 18-month-long program. But it sort of piggybacks on what was said just before me in terms of um, expertise in the community. There is a lot of expertise in the community. And I think far too often we generate reports like this, we solicit uh, advice, input from individuals that we pay a lot of money to. And there are community organizations that are ready and willing to do this work um, for no cost at all. So I'd like to know who those people were selected and how they were selected. It talks about an ideas jam. I've been to a number of these ideas jam, idea jams, and never once was there a connection to uh, this report. So I'm curious which one. Um, I take a look again. What is um, driving? What is underneath? Uh, and where we take our our, our motivations from with plans like this. And when I look at a leadership table and, and I see someone like Bob Rennie, uh, the president and CEO of Rennie Marketing Systems, as one of the key contributors to a project like this, again, it really concerns me. We're talking about a program that's about delivering services to community. One of the biggest impacts on livability is this runaway densification that we have in our city. And one of the key contributors is someone that is absolutely participating 
to our runaway densification, and that's on your leadership of uh, 30. I don't have enough time. I'm running out here now, but I'm just going to point out one thing. So your goal number one, a good start, uh, talks about kids uh, coming into kindergarten ready. I'm asking you, why do you not have something in here about once kids are in school? Thunderbird Elementary School over at Hastings, uh, and, and, or Victoria and Hastings, I spoke to a teacher there this summer. She, has, she teaches one classroom with 22 students. 16 of those students are on individual education plans. Those 22 students span three grades. The majority of those students are Aboriginal. A project and program like this isn't just about getting kids ready before they get to kindergarten. It's about addressing kids that are in the program, our school system, right now, and we are failing them. I haven't heard any of you speak about these kids Mr. over there. Mr. Chernin, I know you know you're over time, and I was yeah. trying to give you some leeway, but you are now well over time. Okay, thank you okay. very much. I appreciate that. Um, Councillor Carr. Yes, uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Um, just thank you, uh, Mr. Chernin, for being here. And I will ask the questions you've asked of staff so that okay. we can hear a response back, um, the one about how individuals were selected and also about the ideas, Jan. Um, in terms of how individuals were selected and your point about expertise that is just generally in the public, mm -hmm. how would you um, suggest our staff actually access um, better, in, mm -hmm. your, in your mind, I guess, better, yeah. uh, that expertise that, um, in the general population? You know, there, there's, there are community groups out there like the Coalition of Vancouver Neighborhoods that's talked about um, utilizing our identified neighborhoods uh, across Vancouver, the 22 identified neighborhoods. Put neighborhood councils back in, fund them, give them the resources to tap into their communities for ideas that can be brought back here and actually be part of the planning process. I think that's an easy way. And I don't think they'll ask for a, a dollar in terms of payment. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I just have one clarifying question. You had said you were at Thunderbird Elementary, which you cited as being at Victorian Hastings, which it is not. So were you at McDonald at Victoria? Sorry, McDonald. McDonald. Okay, McDonald. great. Yeah, thank, thank, you. thank you. Okay, that's it. Okay, next up we have um, Joel Brownstein and then Brendan Bailey. Oh, and just as you're making it to the microphone, uh, we got to go through the... <laughs> so let me run through the options here. Um, are, is there anyone here who is intending to speak who is not yet on the speakers list? No. Okay, so looks like we have two speakers left. Uh, I'm anticipating questions to staff and then, of course, uh, motion, debate, and a potential decision. Uh, I have no idea how long that would take, but I would say it'll be a minimum of an hour. Um, so if you're, I think you need to know that before you extend and assuming you don't want a recess before we're done the meeting. Okay, so we will do that and go straight through. So motion on the floor is to extend to complete the business. Um, seeing no questions, I will call the vote. All in favor, any opposed? None, we will continue to go. Um, and if someone does need a short recess, just flag me and, um, and I can make that happen. Okay, Mr. Brownstein, the, the floor is yours. At Little Mountain Neighbourhood House, and uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. I wanted to start by acknowledging and applauding the city for taking this bold and progressive step in developing such a comprehensive strategy, creating a healthy city pulling various threads of city initiatives together and weaving them into one strategy statement. In reading the related documents, it was great to see how many places neighborhood houses fit and how aligned the strategy is with the work that we do in our communities. In the first uh, minutes, in the few minutes I have to address Council, I thought I'd just touch on a few of the guiding principles and assumptions of the strategy. First, under the principles of health and well-being are part of everyone's business and enabling collective impact, I totally agree with the coordination between the city departments being essential. And as a city has been built uh, on a, as a city of neighborhoods, the success of these strategies um, require coordination at the neighborhood level. And we're willing to work 
with the city and other partners to seek solutions and to support the engagement with those most vulnerable in the city. Um, second, while I agree with the social innovation and new approaches uh, are important to meeting the aspiring goals of the strategy, we don't want to ignore what has been working in the past. For instance, uh, the Vancouver neighborhood houses have had some real successes in collaborating efforts in building welcoming and inclusive neighborhoods by sharing best practices and approaches to reach and engage newcomers. In reviewing the goals, targets and indicators outlined in the summary, I saw neighborhood houses work in every one of them. Again, because of time, I'll just give a few examples. First, the goal of feeding ourselves well has the indicators of food assets and the neighborhood food networks. Little Mountain ne Neighborhood House only this year received the Sustainable Food Network grant funding to establish a uh, neighborhood food network in our area. And one of our first tasks was to develop a food asset map that will synchronistically be launched just next week. Another goal of the Healthy Human is Healthy Human Services. Uh, identified one of its indicators as proximity to community hubs, including neighborhood houses. The local hubs help connect individuals and families with the web of community services that can be difficult to navigate and access without support. This ties in closely with cultivating connections goal. Little Mountain Neighborhood House, along with the other Metro Vancouver neighborhood houses, have been part of a four-year research project in partnership with three universities, UBC, SFU, and University of Victoria, that are studying the impact of neighborhood house have on building community efficacy. The initial finding has some promising results and insights into the best ways of building social networks, creating a sense of belonging, and providing opportunities to contribute by using an asset-based approach. Finally, I recognize further alignment regarding the goals of active living and getting outside. For the past two years, we've been funded by United Way Success by Six program to embed physical literacy and nature exploration into programs and activities for, for families with children under age six, um, using a train-the-trainer train model. We're confident that starting these initiatives early in the child's development will have long-term positive outcomes. In closing, I want to again congratulate the city in the great work already accomplished in phase one of the Healthy City for All strategy and support the next phase, the development of a comprehensive four-year action plan. We want to work with the city in developing and implementing the plan in our local neighborhoods. Thank you. You do have questions from Councillor Carr. Presenting. Um, I was just uh, talking to somebody at a neighborhood house who said that they had um, a lot of concern apropos of your point around welcoming newcomers um, at the loss of uh, dollars for settlement um, uh, strategies or settlement um, programs. Um, is that your experience and um, is this a sig significant impact on your ability uh, to welcome and should the city be um, for lack of a better word, lobbying the federal government or pressing the federal government to reinstate those kinds of dollars? Um, I, I guess I would answer that uh, th uh, the settlement dollars are, are specifically targeted only for newcomers, but at neighborhood houses, really the work that we do with newcomers is embedded in all the work that we do. Um, so there are um, many other opportunities to, um, to uh, work with and, and connect with, with newcomers. Um, uh, it, it is a concern, but it's certainly there are um, many avenues that are being, uh, that, um, through groups that are organized across the, uh, the city, the province, and the country that are um, advocating for dollars to stay within the federal government uh, settlement area. Okay, so there's advocacy work already going on. Yeah. yeah. Great, thank you. Great, thanks very much. Okay, uh, next up we have Brendan Bailey with City Studio. Hello, Mr. Bailey. Hello. Thank you for having me, Council. Um, my name is Brendan Bailey and I'm a student at City Studio. I'm talking on behalf of some of the students you'll see behind me. Excuse me, I'm a little bit nervous, so my voice is shaky. <coughs> 
So just to begin, so everyone has a brief description of what City Studio is. City Studio is an innovation hub inside of City Hall, where students from the six post-secondary institutes in Vancouver come together through the processes of dialogue and design. We collaborate to launch real-world projects for the city. To begin today, I'd like to start by telling the story of how I got here. I moved to Vancouver from my hometown of Calgary four years ago to attend UBC. I moved here specifically to Vancouver because I didn't feel like I was at home in Calgary anymore. And something about this city seemed to speak to me. Since making the move to Vancouver, my life has changed in a number of ways. I moved, out of my, I moved out on my own for the first time. I started to understand what it means to be an adult. And I, each and every day, I'm learning to navigate a world that isn't always kind, all while living in one of the most beautiful cities in the world. The reason that the healthy city strategy is important to me and important to young people like myself is because even though Vancouver has been called one of the most livable cities in the world, there's still a lot of room for improvement. Problems like affordability, feeling safe everywhere, feeling genuinely connected to one another are real issues for me and for the people I know. I see the Healthy City strategy as both an answer and a mechanism in a conscious effort to make Vancouver the best place to live. For myself, the Healthy City strategy reflects my values of what it means to live in a city that recognizes the importance of healthy people, healthy communities, and healthy environments. Because to me, a healthy city means more than just being physically healthy. It means I feel safe, I feel included, I feel vibrant. A healthy city to me means that I'm not the only one who feels this way, but that everyone around me feels the same way. I'm participating in City Studio because it's one of the few opportunities I have as a student where I'm able to create and realize projects that are directly involved in making sure that Vancouver is the healthiest, greenest, and most engaged city there is. I'm so grateful to be a part of this program because it allows me to participate in, a, in the city in a way I never thought possible. Uh, it has given me the opportunity to learn practical skills that I'm taking in every aspect of my life, and the Healthy City strategy is integral to that work. Uh, for me and my peers, what we're doing, we're trying to address the real problems in Vancouver, and we use the Healthy City strategy currently as one of the models in order to inform the work we do. The project that myself and my team are working on currently, um, we've incorporated goal seven from the Healthy City strategy of cultivating connections, and we use that as a focal point to work, f to inform all the work that we do. We call ourselves the apartment innovators, and what we're doing is we're trying to foster vertical communities inside of apartment buildings. We do that by working in spaces because these are spaces that are supposed to feel like home to people, but often, for many, it instead feels like a space that's lonely, a space you go to eat and to sleep, not a space that you have friends in. This is why, for me, the Healthy City strategy is important, because it affects me, because it informs what I'm doing, and because it has changed, it's going to change my life, and it's going to change the lives of those around me, especially for the people in Vancouver. And for me, a council that adopts the Healthy City strategy, healthy city strategy as a strategy for the entire city proves to me that I was right in choosing Vancouver as my new home. Thank you. I appreciate you. you taking the time to come today. And you do have questions from, do you want to guess which councillor? <laughs> councillor Carr. Councillor Carr. You're welcome. So predictable. <laughs> um, I am so intrigued by how you create, or what you are doing to create vertical community and high rises. Uh, so we're, right now we're in the, the beginning stages sort of of our project. What we're looking at um, is we're using the idea of a community concierge. So in other apartment buildings around the world, there are concierge people that greet you. Like sort of, they know a little bit about everybody in the building. And so our idea is that we'd like to go into one apartment building and test out the idea of having um, a resident that lives in the apartment building as their kind of community concierge. They know a lot about the the neighborhood around them, they know the people that live in the building, and then they're able to like foster connections that way. They're like, oh, Doris that lives in like 3B, she loves Mad Men, so do you. Like, you guys should talk, and then stuff like that. It's like really what we're trying to do is face-to-face -face connections so that going forward, like we don't need to be there, that that will be something that the city will want to do, like continue to do. Fantastic, thank yeah. you. Thanks. Great, thank you, that's it for questions. Okay, um, I, I need a little advice from council. Maybe I'm um, influenced by the subject matter, healthy city, and I'm thinking about a healthy council and healthy staff. Um, we are sitting here at 12 o'clock. Um, I 
suspect that this will be at least another hour, if not a bit longer, between questions and debate and possible amendments. Um, so the question for Council is, um, I think as Chair and having gone to this movie a few times, um, my observation is we all do better with higher blood sugar than we might have at this point in the day. Um, so my suggestion might be that we take a half an hour break to go procure like whatever we need to to get our blood sugar back up. The challenge of course for staff is that that's a fast run in half an hour. Unless you were smart and brought sleeping bags and lunches with you. Okay, you did. Okay. So um, what I'm going to suggest then is that we take a break to 12.45. That's like 40 some odd minutes, which gives everybody enough time to race somewhere and get food and come back here. Is that good enough? Okay. Uh, there is no food on the way. You, you are on your own today. So, um, uh, so Council, we are going to take a break to 12.45 uh, and we will be back here then to go to, uh, sorry, and before you all leave, um, if you have questions for staff, of course it's always helpful to email them and I believe Ms. Sack will be the one, um, but we'll start off when we get back with questions to staff. Thank you.